Hey everyone, welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and you can call me Wolf or Mr. Turner. I don't care. Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com, Patreon.com slash PRTPodcast. That's how you can uh, help out with the show. People are doing that. That's we, we appreciate that. You want to explain that to them, Tony? Yeah, uh, we have a ten dollar tier, a twenty dollar tier, and a thirty dollar tier. If you have a ten, if you subscribe for the ten dollar tier for about three months, then we have some we call a swag bag. If you want to skip that three month waiting period and just you sign up for the twenty dollar tier, and we have an even better swag bag at the thirty dollar tier that we send out for just you know helping us out and being a part of it. Uh, and if you notice on my left, I guess you could see our special guest, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> And say hi, David. You wanna... Good evening. How's everyone doing? Yeah, that's D- David Weatherly, folks, is in the studio today with us. Everybody was like hyped about it because I had actually announced it. Now I know normally, I know normally that uh, when we have a guest, uh, I don't tell anybody who it is. <clears throat> they just it's a surprise. <clears throat> but this last week, I figured, you know what? Um, I believe I announced it uh on one of the podcast episodes might have been tuesdays or thursdays but anyway i announced it and so people were asking me about it and we're, we're kind of excited to have david in the studio uh david actually you live here in central texas right? oh yeah hill yeah. country's home has been for a long time yeah and so that is uh it's fortunate for us it's fortunate for me because i get to hang out with them sometimes when we can find time with our busy schedules uh first thing i wanted to say though Remember last Tuesday's episode. It, it, it's they're going to be the numbers are going to be a little different, okay? Because the Tuesday episode I think was two two fourteen, right? Yeah. And then two two and then Wednesday's episode was two fifteen. So two fourteen was actually uh, which one was it that we dropped? I'm over here blinking out the sh- uh, shapeshifter, wasn't it? The the one about the the preacher and the priest, yeah. Uh, And I want to get into that just for a second because I had some people asking me some questions who were kind of confused by that. So maybe when I went back and I listened to it, first I thought you were all just stupid. Um, And then I thought, no, wait, maybe it's me that's stupid. But that can't be right because we all know I'm an expert, right? So I might have made a mistake. But then again, I may have made a mistake thinking I made a mistake. But what we're going to do, I'm going to explain it to you right now. The the Garitano episodes are Thursdays. We're going to drop them on Thursday, Okay. Because we have things to do on Wednesday. So we, Thursday, and that'll happen the next two weeks, you'll get the continuation for three weeks on Garitano's. People were asking me what happened, why we only did the one hour. And I said, well, they'll be next week and then the week after. You'll have a Tuesday show that'll drop every Tuesday like normal in perpetuity. And then, But this is a special three-day series for Thursday. It's not going to be every Thursday. Somebody was asking me about that too, or some people were. Uh, thank you for that donation, Lunar Eclipse. We appreciate that. Donations are unexpected, but they are appreciated. But since we're now a cult, I'm going to ramp it up and say probably you should all be giving me money because I mean, we can't build a cult without money, right? So anyways, because uh, we've been accused of now I'm a cult leader, apparently, for saying something on Facebook. But that's fine. I, I appreciate that person's input. Um, and you're, you person who was angrily saying the things on Facebook and everybody else was happy, but you were unhappy. So we're all going to stop what we're doing in our happiness and, and cater to your uh, being unhappy. Everybody take a moment to cater to this person's unhappiness. Okay. That's all you get. So anyways, but if you join the cult, then you can be happy again. That's why I'm here to please you. So anyway, everybody, just just hang on to your hats. We're gonna have a we have a lot of material coming up, a lot of show uh, good stuff coming in, uh, and like what I mean by that is like show worthy. Like I've been getting a lot of good stories lately, and Tony and me have been kind of overwhelmed um, with what's been going on. Now, when we look through the stories, typically what happens is I look through them and I find the good ones. Tony just prints stuff out and then he throws them all over the room. It's kind of like having a high-powered chimp with you that actually thinks a little more, but then takes a lot of breaks and doesn't actually poop on the floor. He actually is he's, he's housebroken, but everything else about him is just out there, dude. So we did recover a couple of the, the emails that he wanted to read, um, but they were just they were scribbled on. We're, we're still working on that, right, Tony? Uh, I'm on break right now, so. Okay. Yeah, that's what I figured. 
That's exactly right. So, anyways, folks, Sugar Britches, thank you for that donation. Um, okay, yeah, J- uh, Jamie Rochin, Scorpion just texted me. Thank you for donating too during the pre the pre show. We appreciate that. Thank you for that donation. I didn't want to forget. And then uh, somebody asked me to show this guy. So I'm I'm going to show it real quick, and then we're going to get started talking to David. That's why he's here. Let me make sure that I get this person. They they reached out to me. Let's see if I got their name. Well, anyway, he goes by Magic Man. That's the only thing. Okay. See, how can you do that on Facebook? Y'all make these crazy names. If I put a different name, like Bubblish Fish Eye or you know, Wolf Turd 82 or whatever, they, what they do is they, they ask me to show my real name and show them an ID. So I can't put a, a name on there. I couldn't put Wolf on there at all because they jumped me. Um, but y'all are in cahoots with Facebook, obviously, mm-hmm. magic, man. Anyway, magic, here, here's what you were asking for. That's the sculpture by Charlie Perez before he went off the reservation, and there it is right there. So there you go. And, and he did a good job on that. And I think for like 150 bucks or something, he'll make a figure of you too. So go check Charlie out. But uh, here's what we got going on. We got David Weatherly in, in the studio. So this is a real treat. So David, we talk all the time and we, we didn't even really go over much about, you know, what we were going to discuss. No, nothing at all. Uh, <laughs> frankly, I'm a little bit concerned about what I've gotten into because I'm hearing about intelligent monkeys and uh, <laughs> some kind of cult and, I guess, bags of indoctrination material, which I didn't get one when I came in, so I guess I'm all right. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's it's good. I mean, this is the first t- chance I've had to get in the studio, and like you said, we talk all the time. So, yeah, wherever it goes, it goes. Yeah. And so what I was hoping is um, – we could talk a little bit about when you came over to the house, you ended up celebrating your birthday in my haunted house. Which, <laughs> part, part of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, was uh, it was actually the following day, but I was at your house, of course, well after midnight talking. So <laughs> Yeah, you were like, dude, and, and then you, you're, you, the, the, the clock struck midnight and you were at the house and we were talking about yeah. Devil's Backbone. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting conversation and that could also be a starting point for us. So folks... Um, we got the chat filling up here. We got about 200 people in here. Uh, we can start rolling with this. Uh, if anybody has any questions for David, let me put my eyes on here. We need to, uh, pay it, pay close attention, me, Anthony and Tony. And we will, if you have questions, hopefully he's got answers. Dick Richards says, David, did you know the Babylonians referred to Mott as the father of the black eyed children? <laughs> okay, D- uh, Dick, wh- who is Mott? Explain that to us. Larry, hey, how's it going? Madeline, I'll see you in here. How you doing, everybody, all my peeps? Barton, Barton's in the chat. Hey, Barton. Hey, Barton. <laughs> he-, he noticed your shirt. Show him your shirt. Uh, give for Barton some love there. There you go. There you go, Barton Nunley in Humanoids. So, David, you have been really busy. You've been working, doing a lot of work. Like a lot of books. I I have. And uh, I know I've had a few messages, you know, people uh, get really anxious about the cryptid state series. And I've had several people ask me, when's the next one out? Of course, they start asking that as soon as the the current one drops. Uh, The latest one is Maine, Monsters of the Pine Tree State. And um, I I will say that there are more coming out this year. I'm, I'm kind of in a unique spot right now because I'm working on several books at the same time. And, uh, of course, people who know me know I don't reveal the the titles or the subject Mm -hmm. matter, but uh, there are more state cryptid books coming this year. So, uh, you know, if you have a story from your state or from a state, whatever, that I haven't covered yet, feel free to send it to me. It might end up in a book. Yeah. What states have you covered so far? I'm almost losing track. <laughs> There's 15 I, I ha- of them, and right? I ha- and I have to stop and think because I'll, I'm always a couple ahead, so I have uh, two that are almost complete. Um, let's see. I've covered, oh, my gosh, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, Alaska, Indiana, uh, Maine, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, uh, Vermont. I know I'm forgetting some. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sitting here trying to think. It's it's turned into Alaska. quite a series. Uh, Alaska? I think I said Alaska. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that interesting enough. 
you know, the Alaska book has probably been the most popular one. And I think part of that is just because of the, the whole sort of allure of Alaska. You know, it's mm -hmm. a unique place and the last frontier, right? And a lot of people, whether they've been there or not, they're fascinated by the legends and everything. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it is a pretty fascinating state. Uh, but that one in the Arizona book, I think, have been the most popular. I think, I think, in my opinion, and this is just my humble opinion, I think the reason that the Alaskan book has done so well is because you were on my show with that one. <laughs> and, it's got to be talk, it. And that's also the one where I, I talk too much on that one. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, I didn't really say anything on that show, but you... <laughs> I, got, I got roasted on that But I was that here. <laughs> <laughs> and the Alaska book was out, so... Yeah. It, 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 so... it might have worked in my favor because people were probably so aggravated, they are like, this guy's got to have something to say. I'm going to read his book. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember, I remember there was like this, uh, some, I'm not gonna, I don't even remember her name, but some woman had said something about, well, what does this guy know about Alaska in the, in the chats of, of one of the groups we were in? And she was like saying something about you. What do you know about Alaska? And I just remember we were all on that thread and I was like, because he wrote a book about it, he did some research on it. <laughs> and she was like, well, I'm no expert, but you know, I know about the, uh, it was the Kushtika mm -hmm. and how you pronounce it and how you said it. And everybody that was there was like, dude, he, he's never mispronounced it at all. <laughs> but everybody thinks that they, thank you, Larry, for that donation. That's a, that's a big donation. Well, I've been to Alaska dollars. on a number of occasions too. I mean, yeah. it's not like I, uh, I, I've I'm, been there once. I, I am not just an armchair researcher by far. No, I, not at know, all. I've spent most of my life traveling and uh, investigating these cases, talking to witnesses. And, you know, for me, that's part of the whole thing. I, I like to, even if it's a historical case, I like to go to the location. And, you know, it might be completely changed from what it was originally, but I, I like to go there and I like to see, and I, and I like to see, you know, what people's memories are. Uh, if some of these towns, you know, that have had, legends that have grown up around them over the decades i mean they're still affected by it to some degree mm -hmm. and you know in recent years we've seen more of these festivals become popular of course everybody knows about the mothman festival uh in point pleasant but you know there's the van meter festival in iowa it's another book i've done uh that you know the guys uh chad lewis a good friend of mine he and yeah. kevin nelson and some other oh, yeah. folks have done a really good job trying to promote that strange case that happened in the early 1900s you know this weird winged creature uh, that sort of terrorized this town for a brief amount of time and it, it's interesting a, a lot of that area is very much like it was back then i mean it's a small little town you know it really hasn't changed a whole lot so you can get a feel for what it must have been like you know some of the buildings are still there that uh, were significant in the the sightings so you know, other places have had festivals. Uh, the Beast of Busco. Everybody mm -hmm. knows the giant turtle. That's giant on the turtle. cover of my Indiana mm -hmm. book. That's just a fascinating legend. And, you know, they had a, a festival there for many years. I'm not sure. I know COVID shut it down for a couple of years. I don't know if it's come back or not. But that's a little town called Trobusco. And, you know, they had a whole festival designed around the beast of busco it's called turtle days and uh turtle you know, days. with all these these turtle themed things going on so it's cool to see to go to these places and see how the community reacts to the stories that are an inherent part of their history i think one of the th one of the things i think that's i don't know how do you say it like um like whenever we've talked, you and I, you always are, are on location, uh, like interviewing people, mm. and you actually like to go and talk to the witness yourself in person and investigate the place whenever possible. Whenever I possible, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and that's something that's admirable. I'm kind of lazy. I just talk to them on the <laughs> phone, and I'm like, send me a picture. And then when they send me a picture of the grass and trees, I'm like, that's fake. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, but I'm still going to use your story. I'm joking. I'm kidding, folks. I I'll talk to that. them on the phone or, or, you know, Skype or something sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and, of course, there's no way to follow up every report or everything that's you know, comes across the desk. But uh, after they're, you know, kind of vetted with the basic parameters, uh, if, it's, if it's something really fascinating, you, yeah, by all means, I try to go and meet the person. Because you gain a lot more from a face-to-face -face interview mm -hmm. than you do just talking on the phone. You That's know, exactly a lot right. There's a lot of subtleties in, in body language and mannerisms and uh, just 
you know, you get to see how they react when you ask them certain questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think you can learn so much just in that brief amount of time of talking with someone. So, if, so in, in other words, what he's saying, folks, is somebody comes up and they're like, I got a Bigfoot story. Am I getting paid for this? Then he's probably not going to stick around. He's going to be like, no, I'm out of here. Goodbye. He ain't got no rock. <laughs> and then David's gone. That's it. So here's here's what I, I wanted to ask you, David, and I wanted to say I wanted to, this was an important conversation that you and I had, and I thought that it would be uh, important to bring up, and you know, when you would get, getting you in the studio here, um, we have, and this is all seriousness, folks. We have gotten reports as of late of not only Dogman in the Hill Country, but of bear bear looking type people, like this werewolf looking thing, but it's not. It's not a werewolf. It's how how would you describe it, Tony? What would what would you call this? A, a werebear? I mean, I guess the closest description would be werebear, but it's just everything is similar to a werewolf, except the ears are more rounded and a, just a huger head. Yeah. I mean, well, the, the ears are usually triangular but short. Yeah, that's right. Not these long mm -hmm. ears that were that we were getting stories, and so. I don't, I don't, I don't know what this thing is, I, and so we're trying to come up with a name for it. But when we were talking last night, you said Bear Man. This is very simple, like Dog Man. <laughs> but the the Dog Man doesn't look to me. The reports I get, I don't get people saying, "Hey, I saw this thing that looked like a Rottweiler mixed with a man." Well, you know, it, I just don't get reports like that. And they say that they, it looks like a wolf. You know, mixed, right? Yeah, you know. and they always describe the head as very wolf like. But these things that we're getting, you know, now, and it's unfortunately in an, an area where, where you reside close to you, um, and th they look like bears, but they move around. Their locomotion, everything is like a human's, mm -hmm. but they have a humongous bear-like head with the smaller triangular ears. And yeah, I guess Tony, they are a little rounder, I guess, um, but not like a round like a bear's. They're, and, and, but they're not like this dude, like here. They're not pointy like the up and down. Like this looks a lot like what I saw, a little bit different in the face and the ears were, they stuck up straighter. That, you know, what, what the reports we're getting are these, their, their ears are smaller. And, but have you encountered that yet? Like, have you been like and, and interviewed people who have told you that or? Well, you know, it's interesting. Now, I haven't interviewed this lady in person yet, but I, I've had a couple of emails with her, and I've talked to her on the phone once. Uh, this woman recently told me that she had an encounter in Hill Country. And um, I, I'm not going to say the location yet on, on air, and there's a reason for that that mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you later. But uh, she was in Central Texas and had this encounter. Now, she... Her husband apparently saw it too, but not as extensively as she did. Uh, she thought initially that she was seeing a Bigfoot, but she told me that the face was mutilated. And, you know, at first she told me that, and I thought, you know, you automatically think, well, it's probably, you know, disfigured. Maybe there's a scar or something. Well, that's not what she meant. She said that the, uh, when I talked to her the next time, she said, well, I don't really mean mutilated. It's more distorted from, it doesn't look like the Bigfoot, drawings that you see you know or the stuff you see on television and i said how do you mean she said well this looked more like it had a snout and i said okay that's interesting i said well, what was it a you know what kind of a a snout how would you describe it you know short long can you give me any details and uh she said well it, it wasn't like a dog's snout it was shorter than that but it did protrude and I said, is there any animal that you can think of that it would, would resemble? She kind of thought for a few minutes, and she said, well, maybe kind of like a bear. Mm. So that's kind of the extent of, the, of what I've gotten out of her so far. Unfortunately, she didn't have a lot of time when I spoke with her last. But um, this is kind of curious after the reports that you've received. And, you know, I've received a couple of similar things that some of these people think they're seeing a Sasquatch, but that it's one that doesn't uh, fit – what they see on television, yeah, the you know, on, on the shows. And I think that this is a, a good case of people don't have any box to put this in. Mm -hmm. You know, they're seeing something they can't really rationalize and it's on two legs, but it doesn't look like <laughs> even something as unusual as a Bigfoot, which they have enough problem with, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a lot of these people don't even believe in Bigfoot, but they're seeing this thing that goes outside the 
the boundaries of that. So they're really struggling with, you know, how do I, you know, how do I rationalize this? It's, and like I said, now her husband saw it, but he doesn't even want to talk about it. And he, and he's convinced that, oh, well, you know, it was, I, I don't know. It was a, he has a different excuse every time, apparently. Like one time it's, well, it was a trick of the light. And, and she's angry with him because she's like, it's not a trick of the light. It was standing on two legs. Yeah. You know, he was first saying, well, maybe it was a dog, you know, maybe it was a dog like with its front paws up on, on something. Or, and she's like, there's nothing there for it to put its front paws on. It was something standing on two legs. And, uh, of course, he went through the whole, well, it's a guy in a costume thing. And, you know, all the standard, how can I make this something that I can understand that's logical? Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to deal with something that's outside the boundaries of the accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that tends to be, you know, the uh, procedure, what goes on. And when you see something like this, I'd say the first thing that happens is you go through a series of emotions. You know, and the first mm -hmm. emotion is just you're in shock and you're trying to get your bearings. And then you start trying to rationalize. The final emotion is acceptance. <laughs> you yeah. have to accept that this happened. And sometimes people aren't ready to do that. And other Not people, everybody does that, though. Yeah, Not some people don't. That stage. They just, yeah, they just uh, put it out of their mind. You know, um, a friend of mine's dad was like that when we were young, uh, and I just recently got in touch with him. He saw what I can only describe as a Bigfoot right outside of Cameron, Texas, mm -hmm. and he just for years he wouldn't talk about it. Now I think I might finally have made a breakthrough. He's a childhood friend of mine since I'm eight years old, and his dad. But what happened was it wasn't a pleasant experience at all. And so it kept him up in a tree stand, and he kept trying to say for years that it was a bear. Right. Yeah, and now, and I'm going like, there's no bear. I mean, well, I'm going to take that back. There are bears, very rare, and some black bears, even though they're called black bears, are actually brown. Mm -hmm. And so what he saw was brown, and his, his son would say, well, no, it, was a, it, was a black, it wasn't a black bear. You know, but I had to explain to him, well, some black bears actually are brown. But... What he saw was on two legs, and it was large, way larger than a black bear would be, seven and a half, eight feet tall. It was squatch-like. The only problem is that it had a snout. Yeah. See, now I'm starting to wonder, because I had kind of classified that as a gugwi, and you know what that is, mm -hmm. right? But that is kind of a, a catch-all term for anything that looks like it's not a normal dog man or, you know, or it's not Bigfoot. Kind of the two together. Yeah. But now I'm starting to think that these bear people or bear men, uh, I know Josh Nokia has done a lot of work with those, um, like like on his show, you know, in the, in the national parks and all that. Um, and I've gotten a lot of reports. And now I'm kind of going back through the archives, or we have been the last two weeks, and pulling some of these reports that we thought were dogman or maybe uh, a Bigfoot, Gugwe type, you know, Creature, people say the, the the beast of seven shoots. That photo supposedly is a gugwe. I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I've I've reserved my opinion on pictures. Um, you know, there's recently a big firestorm happened on Facebook because of a certain individual. I'm not going to mention his name, but a lot of people were messaging me. Did you see what he said? Did you see what he did? And I was like, I quit. I ignored him a long time ago. <laughs> you know, it's the hoaxing and whatever. And I'm not going to get into involved in it. But let's just say that. If you want my opinion, who takes pictures of a towel rack? That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to get into, like, I've never in my life in almost 50 years been like, you know what? I'm going to take a picture of that beach towel. It's just, why, what, why? So just use common sense, folks. That's it. I'm not going to get into who it is, what it is. Y'all probably already know. I got messages by a thousand people from the community about my opinion on that. And I said the same thing to everybody. And then somebody reposted it on there, what I said, but they didn't You think they didn't quote me. But, yeah, I mean, I just – the first thing I thought was, like, if you're going to take, take a picture of – this is really quick here, and, David, y'all probably agree, um, not to speak for you, but it, why would somebody just take a random photo of nothing? And then, it, <laughs> you know, oh, look what appeared when I took a picture of the, you know, the corner of the room. I mean, like, there's nothing there. So why would you do that unless it was an accidental picture, which is how rare is that, you know? I had one person who actually had a picture 
that they they took and they said it was their phone was in their pocket and somehow the phone the camera opened up and then it started snapping photos and there just happened to be pictures of demons in his pocket and I was like wow dude that's, that's a lot of stuff that has to happen you know and then you have to do a lot of middle gymnastics and have a extreme pareidolia to to see these pictures and he found like you know seven or eight different pictures and you know arrows on there. I, I think he even saw Andromeda and the Pleiades on there. I was like, dude, I, I don't know what you're seeing. I don't see this. I mean, even connecting the dots, you know, and I'm sure people have thought this before when you see uh, constellations, you're like, how are they connecting all this? There's like two stars and they make like, you know, Oprah Winfrey. And you're like, how does that work? Well, that's what this person was doing. And then they become angry with me because I didn't want to repost the photos. Well, folks, y'all know me. I don't repost photos. I got a, a huge, huge library of them, and I don't repost them. There's just no point because they're all going to be fake, you know. doesn't matter whether they are or not. I could take it myself, and then I would post it on there. And then after 30 comments, I may actually start questioning myself and thinking, hey, man, maybe I did fake it. I don't know. You know, because this is what happens. Everybody's going to say it's a fake. So photo evidence, and now with AI, there is no taking pictures. I mean, forget it. And so, you know, I'm just going to say that and that's it. But th this thing that we're looking at now, I, I want to start a new classification because I don't know if this Gugwe type creature, the bear man, is one and the same. People say that the Gugwe has human-like legs and it has a snout, but that's not always the case. I had a case in Washington where a guy had, had was reading a meter. And I've told this uh, story before, and it, and it was very much a Sasquatch. Um, long story short, people have already heard it before, I'm sure, but David, I, I know I haven't told you. And it chased him in Washington down a hill. And, you know, back in the 80s, you know, everybody had the little toy trucks, you know. He mm -hmm. had one of those little for his work. And this thing, he ran, jumped over into the back of the bed of the truck, and then over it and kept going. And this, whatever it was, smashed into his truck and just flipped it and threw it out of the way like it was a stick. You know, and now these aren't big trucks, folks, but they're not these smart cars either. Right. You know, they're little Toyota trucks and, and Nissan trucks, whatever. Well, it tossed it aside like like it was kindling, like nothing, like a piece of wood, mm -hmm. and then chased him down to the uh, uh, highway, and he was right outside of Spokane. Uh, and so he said that this <laughs> this thing chased him, and then he was like, dude, I'm African-American, and I'm trying to wave cars down, and nobody's stopping. He's like, I'm over here going like, please, you know. But he said he turned, and he saw it in the tree line, and this thing was it, it was watching him. It didn't come out of the tree line. It was very intelligent. It wasn't like a rabid animal. Mm -hmm. Like, it knew what it was doing. And then eventually, a highway patrol pulled over and said, are you okay? And he got out, and he was kind of apprehensive. Like, why is this guy screaming, yelling, waving around? And he's like, there's something chasing me. He points to the tree line. The guy looks. And then he's like, get in the car. Get in the car. And they took off together. And he's like, what was that thing? And this the guy, the gas meter guy, he's like, I don't know. I, I have no idea. It was behind these people's house. Right. And it chased me, you know, about 200 yards. I've been running from this thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, who, who's going to pick me up? I'm a big old sweaty dude chasing you know, trying to yeah. wave cars down and people are just going right past him and he's running along the road luckily a highway patrol stopped so when i when i talked to this guy i was like give me a description one of the things he said about it was he goes the face looked like almost bear like but it was like a gorilla you know mm -hmm. so it made me think of like a, a bigfoot so when i told the story i classified it as an angry sasquatch or a gugui but I really don't know. And so I was getting ready to do a show in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to drop it. And we haven't come up with a title yet. Anthony and me have been racking our heads about what we were going to call it. But it is going to be uh, Bear Man Gugwe type reports because mm -hmm. we went and pulled some. Now, originally, you know, and our friend Lyle, you know, we were talking about one-offs. And you know what that is. And you kind of throw it in the one-off pile and you say, well, maybe I'll come back to it. Um, but this one, it, it's, it's, it started out like that, you know, several years ago, just one off. And then I was like, I kept throwing them into the thing and not realizing, oh, wait, I got like five of them in there now. So when you match them up, mm -hmm. you pull those threads, you know, you're like, wait a minute, this isn't a dog, man. This isn't a Bigfoot. This, what is this? You know, Barilla, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, well, you know, what's interesting is that I, I think that, uh, to use your metaphor, if, if you if you start pulling the thread, 
you're likely to find a lot more of those are out there than it initially appears. You know, I, I think that one of the things that happens in this, the, the field, and I use that term very broadly, is that uh, people, when they experience something, first of all, most likely it's, it's outside of the norm for them. It's not something that they ever expected to encounter, whether it's a, a UFO or a Bigfoot or, you know, a ghost or whatever it is. So you get different classifications of how people deal with that psychologically. Now, some people, they just shut it down and they try to pretend it never happened. Some people will say, uh, you know, they'll, they'll just, they'll keep it to themselves or tell a few friends uh, and some people will eventually start talking about it or opening up about it. But there's another factor that comes in for those people who start to share their stories. And it's that, uh, how can I phrase this? Uh, there are certain boxes that things have been put in over the years. So the best example are alien encounters. For... Uh, you know, the, the whole, if you go back in the history of people encountering, quote, aliens, you'll find a vast array of different descriptions of these creatures until, until it was sort of centralized to focus strictly on the little gray aliens. Mm -hmm. So now, if you say alien to anybody who's, you know, not interested in this stuff at all, or even people who are, what automatically comes to their mind? The little gray, big-headed guys, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with spindly bodies and, and big eyes. But that's not the whole history of alien encounters by far. And I know I've talked to people who have had encounters with, the, with what they felt were aliens, but they're uncomfortable talking about it because it doesn't fit that description. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, I, I saw an alien, but it didn't look like an these alien. little gray things yeah. on, in the movies. You know, it looked completely different. And I've seen that some with Sasquatch reports because the popularity of the, the Bigfoot, quote, hunting shows, you know, over the last several years and, and the, the rise in it being part of pop culture. You know, Bigfoot is everywhere. I mean, there's, you constantly see stickers and posters and everything else, right, with – that classic silhouette that was derived from, you know, the Patterson Gimlin film, that classic image of Bigfoot. But what happens if a guy who maybe doesn't believe in Bigfoot, but sees one yet it doesn't fit that description. Now he's going to feel like even more of a fool because one, he's seen a Bigfoot, but two, it doesn't look like everybody else says Bigfoot looks like. So he's going to be reluctant to talk about it if he does talk about it at all. And those type of people, you kind of have to draw them out. You know, this is to come full circle, what you were saying about, uh, you know, these one-off reports. You know, Lyle and I talk about that all the time. And I've got mountains of these things over the years. But guess what? They're usually not one-offs. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a few rare ones here and there, you know, like the lady who saw a centaur or something, you know. But, yeah. uh, you know, you'd be surprised when you start sort of collating these things and say, well— yeah, somebody says they saw a bear man in Missouri, but well, here's somebody eight years later that says they saw one in Utah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what do you do with these things? It's it's certainly it's it's a good example of the fact that the more questions we ask, the more answers we get, the more questions we have. Yeah. <laughs> That's when when you put it in the terms of like, like you said, you say it's a one-off, but then after you make that connection, then it becomes like, okay, there's more than just one of these one-offs. <laughs> you go into your one-off file, and if you haven't gone into it for a while, like I didn't for a little while, I wasn't, because I was like, you know what, when, I, when I'm going to do a paranormal potluck next, I'm going to do one that's a one-off, one just, you know, and I started going through it. And I said, man, I have a lot of these that are similar. And I was just kind of tossing them in there. And they're fun to look at when you want it. For, for me on my show, I do what I call a paranormal potluck. And I'll do a bunch of stories maybe that don't, like one of each category or whatever. Um, but the, the they, like, yeah, the one-offs become more than just one. You know what I mean? And then if you just sift through it, 
like I did the other day, a couple months ago, I started finding all these similar reports. And then when I went back and I started looking for the Bear Man reports, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, which because nothing was like – most of the time when somebody gives me a story, and I don't know how it is with you, but for me, a lot of times what I encounter is people telling me, not saying, hey, I saw this or I saw that. They'll just tell me, look, I have a weird story. I saw something weird. Unless it's, it's like a dog man. Some people will say, I saw a dog man. But then when they tell you the story, it doesn't sound like a dog man at all. Right. But typically they'll tell me, you know, I saw something, you know, and then they'll tell me what it is, in particular with the flying humanoids. Let's, 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 let's go there. They are one of those humanoids. It's one of those creatures where, um, man, it's so hard to, like, classify it. It's like you want to say it's a vampire. You want to say it's a gargoyle. You don't know what it is. You just know that it's, like, some sort of flying creature, and nobody has told me to date or any of us, hey, you know, I saw a gargoyle or a vampire flying around. They'll just say I saw something that looked weird. It may have been a gargoyle. I've heard that. But nobody has actually said it was a vampire, and I classified it as that because I didn't know what else it could be. Mm -hmm. Like the, the flying ones. Now, I've heard people saying that they've seen vampires and creatures that resemble something that looks like a, Holly, a classic Hollywood vampire, but not flying around. Nobody's ever said, hey, I had a vampire flying around my house. Like, that's just not something that people have told me. But I kind of classified it as that. Now, and in the beginning, it was in the one-off file. Um, there was one out of Detroit, and I just kind of tossed it in there. And because I didn't have anything else to compare it to. But then when we did an episode on vampires, I didn't even bother to go in there and look at that file and see... That there was one in there that was like, right. yeah. And so then later on, that one came out, but it it was older than some of those other reports because I had thrown it into the bin. So I know as a researcher and an author, you get that too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And and you know, I mean, we can even we can kind of take that down to a different level too because what I was saying about people like like things to be sort of uh, systemized and in a box. You know, one of my favorite things with this cryptid state series that I've been doing is I, I swear every state there are at least a couple of Bigfoot reports that are just really weird. And I, I should probably compile a book at some point. You know, Bigfoot is weird uh, just because <laughs> just is. because, you know, there are these reports and, and they usually tend to be my favorites. Uh, sometimes they're really quick, but they're reports that uh, someone saw they they say it's a Bigfoot. It fits the description of Bigfoot, but the behavior is not like a traditional uh, Bigfoot sighting. You know, most mm -hmm. people, they say they saw Bigfoot. It's, oh, uh, it was standing by a tree. It was crossing a road. You know, it was walking across the field and the arms were swinging. Those are kind of the basics, right? Everybody says, oh, that's, you know, that's their Bigfoot sighting. But there are always these weird ones that crop up. The The main book... <laughs> As a really brief one, these people were in a cemetery at a funeral. Not the place you're going to hoax a sighting, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> while attending a funeral. They look up and they see this creature strolling across the cemetery. And it, it walks across the cemetery. It goes for a second into this maintenance shed that's on the property. It just pokes in there for a minute, and then it comes out and continues on. Sounds like a normal Bigfoot sighting, but here's the twist. The witnesses all said that it was carrying a caveman club that looked like a Fred Flintstone club over its shoulder. Like, wow. So, so you know, what do you even do with that? Yeah. You know, why, first of all, you know, several people aren't going to just make this up. If they're going to make up a Bigfoot sighting, sure. But why a caveman club? You know, that's just really weird. And this this kind of thing crops up a lot. And I think that we're seeing a bit more of it. Now, you can go back into older case files and you can find things, you know, that people reported uh, the, the brave souls in, in eras like the, you know, the 50s and 60s. <laughs> or the 40s or even further back that, you know, would report these things knowing that, yeah, people are probably going to say that, you know, I'm a crackpot, but this is what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, now I think we're seeing more people comfortable with talking about sightings because of 
the popularity of all these topics, right? And we get some more of the unusual stuff. But I think that the more we look at these unusual sightings, we'll find that uh, there's probably a lot more of them out there than, you know, it initially appears. The flying humanoid thing, man, that's been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, everybody knows about the Mothman sightings. Those are the most famous. But really, you can go all over the country, all over the world, and find some of these reports. You know, they're scattered around. But if you start tracking them down, it's like, you know what? Yeah. Every so often, somebody's reporting, seeing some kind of a thing that's, whether it's a gargoyle or, or a bird man or, you know, something that is, I mean, Houston Batman. You know, mm -hmm. you've got these characters that just show up. And how do you explain it? You know, it's it's unlike you know, a lot of them, I think, are unlikely to be hoaxes because there's never a clear motivation as to why people would make up this story. Mm -hmm. You know, are they just doing it for a lark? Well, in this day and age, maybe you do get some of that. But those are the people that are going to post pictures online that yeah. they've taken of, you know, <laughs> How racks. Their, their curtains or something yeah. saying, you know, oh, well, here it is, you know, yeah. but uh and I, and I have no idea what picture you're referring to. Incidentally, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, really okay. get any time on social media. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's it's just another example. I think that some of those people are just ones probably looking for attention rather than trying to find some answers for something they experienced. Well, also uh, to to speak on that, he as speaks. Well. <laughs> you guys are having a good conversation, so I'll it. but to uh, speak on that is that you know it also I think ends up hurting. A lot of these variations of cryptids like Bear Man and also Dog Man, when you have a lot of these uh, sightings that like of these fans where they already kind of know what to say and what the ideal situation of what the Dog Man looks like, so they kind of just have that checklist. Yeah, they'll, they'll say that now. They're not willing to go into the like, oh, the snout was kind of smaller and the ears were more rounded or like it it was a little bit bulkier and bigger than you would expect for a Dog Man. You'd be like, oh, that's not you know, what's going to get me fame. So I'm not going to say that. Yeah. It's yeah. never like a humanoid poodle or something. Yeah. And, and, and they've done this thing where there's like, there's like 15 different types of dog man. And they're like, well, there's a kind of dog man that flies and has no fur and it looks like a bat. And, you know, and it's like, okay, well, that's not a dog man. And then there's a kind of one that swims in the ocean. looks like a plesiosaur. That's what we call the plesia dog man. And then what, <laughs> And, you know, they're, they're just calling everything a dog man. And, and, like, people will tell me, I have a dog man sighting. And I was like, no, ma'am, that is a homeless guy. And you saw that at the Congress Bridge. That is not a dog man. But although he was very unkept and unshaven. And so you, you get a lot of people that say that. They've seen dog man, but it's not really dog man. I don't, you know, and then I don't know who came up with this silly classification, but you have, like, all these different types now. And they and I'm like, how about they're not all dogmen? How about we just say that they're not all werewolves or whatever you want to call them? Um, because, you know, if it looks like a flying bat humanoid, then that's probably what it is. Is a flying bat humanoid? Why would it, why would it be some sort of flying dogman? Because I literally had somebody message me, and I guess I'm a dogman researcher, which I'm really not. I just look at me as as like paranormal, or whatever. And they'll say, well, you know, I, I had a, an encounter with what. And first, I was very dismissive. This was two. This was in 2020. And Tony, I know you remember this. The, the lady told us that she saw what looked like a flying dogman. Well, oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, that. when she so when she got down to it, I was like, she started telling the story, and I'm like, wait a minute, okay. Now I said, this isn't. This isn't. This is actually is sounds like a flying dogman. Like it really does. It was a very brief encounter, you know. And I don't know how to classified and it's not really like one of those that you could put on the show where it's like you know it's not going to take up 10 minutes it was just her and her husband were taking pictures on the top of a parking garage you know mm. and this thing was in the corner and it just rose up and just flew over them and they, they were like that looks like a werewolf with wings that was it right you know it happened in san diego and that was it i got nothing else you know no other reports from that region that would be a one-off um, now, there is this creature that looks like a gargoyle that I've gotten reports of, and it looks very much like um, what you would consider a, uh, what do you call it, um, gargoyle looking with a dog head, with a dog head. Now, here's the weird thing, and David, I've told my audiences, but I, don't, I know I've never told you. 
There were two reports. They were 11 years apart. One was in Alamogordo, New Mexico. And these people were accosted by something that looked like a gargoyle, but it had like a, a, a dog head, no fur on it, nothing like that. And it was a protruding, a very big protruding snout that was rounded with little bulldog looking ears. And, and they said it in the face, it almost resembled like a bulldog, but it had big old wings and it was gray. Now I went back and I looked and I had a report from date right outside of Dayton, Ohio. 11 years before, this guy was in the station wagon, you know? Mm -hmm. And, like, he even told me, he's like, it was the those 80s station wagons with the wood paneling on the side. Right. You, know, and you load the kids up and the kid, you know, whatever. And it was, like, literally it was Memorial Weekend. And they were going <laughs> out and this thing accosted them. And so, and it had a broken chain. Like, like it looked like it was dangling from its neck. Um, the weird thing was the story from Alamogorda, and I had never talked about this uh, this story. I use this as a case in point. But the people from Alamogordo, totally different people. The first people were Caucasian. They were from Dayton, Ohio, or, or outside of Ohio. And the other uh, people were Hispanic, you know, descent. Mm -hmm. And they saw what they saw. And it was the same situation. And this thing actually grabbed the back of their vehicle, lifted it up a little bit, and dropped it, and went and flew over the top of it. And guess what? It had a chain, just like this, you know, whatever. Well, after I told those story, that story of those two encounters on the show, then I started getting reports of people saying, okay, I saw a gargoyle because I classified it as a gargoyle. Right. Yeah. But before that, you know, people were giving me reports of what sounded like and seemed like a gargoyle, but nothing that was saying, hey, this is a gargoyle, 100%, just what they saw. And now they'll say, hey. You know, because we've, you know, in my audience, we've we're matured and we've gone over so many different topics. They'll say, "Hey, I saw a guard." Like if you look at my shirt, like there, it shows. Hey, this is obviously right here. Spider Man. This is Spider Man <laughs> and Venom down here. Now, this is a Frazetta picture. I saw somebody say something about my shirt. This is a werewolf, and he meets Dracula, mm -hmm. right? Because you can see, I mean, like you know, that looks that looks like Dracula, and Dracula looks like he's in big trouble, but. It, the, the thing is, most people aren't going to go, okay, when you see this right here, it, you, they know that looks like a werewolf, right? They're going to see this guy. They're not going to think, oh, that's a vampire. They don't know that that's a vampire. They're just going to say, you know, it's it looks like a werewolf about to kill a dude. But if you are versed in Hollywood horror movies, you're going to say, oh, that looks like Dracula. And in the background, there's bats and whatever. And, of course, there's a werewolf. Um, but you have to be initiated to kind of know what that is. You do. And, you know, that's an interesting point uh, when you're looking at cases and, re and reports anyway, because I'm all, I'll be honest, I'm always much more intrigued when I get a uh, talking about dogman sightings. I'm much more intrigued when I get an email from someone who says they've seen a werewolf mm -hmm. because, you know, the everyday guy walking around the streets doesn't know what the heck a dogman is. Mm -hmm. He's not going <laughs> to know what you're talking about. I mean, people who are interested in the topic and are in the field they're going to know. And if somebody contacts me and says, I, I saw a dog man, I know one of two things. They're already, you know, they've already read up on the material. They've either, you know, looked online or they've seen something on television or, or something that has led them to this conclusion. Uh, so, you know, then you have to say that it's kind of tainted to some degree because <clears throat> I'm sorry, but if somebody's had an, an encounter and they immediately go and start trying to, you know, read about other encounters and, and determine what it was themselves before they've chronicled their encounter. It can shape. It can change. It, it can shape you know, their They're encounter. going to be influenced and it's going to be, you know, they're going to be subtle changes. So, you know, I, I always say that if someone sees something strange, the first thing to do is to write down absolutely every detail you can remember and, you know, make a drawing if you can, even if it's, even if you're not an artist, just notate everything you possibly can, uh, even just for yourself, before you go researching and trying to figure out, oh, what was that? Uh, otherwise, you're going to be influenced. Yeah. that That's one of the things that I've I've had this conversation with Linda Godfrey. Um, people's in, Okay, so there was one case that me and her looked at together, uh, and it was a guy, and I can't remember which book it was in. I, I think it was the one, it was the one right after Hunting the American Werewolf, I believe, because I go by the timeline. And she had asked me if I'd ever heard anything like that, and it was a, a, a one where someone had 
a, a werewolf type creature that was on someone's front lawn, front porch or whatever, and it was doing sounds kind of silly, but it is in one of her books. If you go back and look, it's kind of dancing around and there's this green mist coming off of it. Mm -hmm. Now I have heard of that. I've had people tell me straight up that there was a werewolf just come this thing change like it was literally becoming human. It wasn't going from human to werewolf. It was going werewolf to human, and they saw a green mist as the hair began to fall off of it, which was really weird, and it happened out at Lake Travis. Now, that, Oh, I know that story. Yeah. That's a really old account. Really? Unless unless this is a this was on someone's porch? No, no, no. Yeah, you're ta I'm talking about two different things. I was about okay. to say, did you hear there's, about that one, too? The well, there's another, there's another really old encounter from Texas that— um, no, it's not at a lake. Uh, it's been a long time since I've looked at this one. It, it was uh, a trio of young men who were out just kind of exploring, and they ended up uh, stopping by this stream. Yeah. And as they're, as they're sitting there uh, just kind of talking or whatever, they notice across the stream this wolf head come out of the brush and is is – kind of staring at them and um this gosh I, I really had to probe the the mental files here this nick redford might have covered this one yeah uh, i had to go back and look in in my database but was it in his werewolf book like the new one that he just revamped would it be in that one because i think i know what you're talking about yeah well the rest of the story was that these these guys saw this wolf head mm -hmm. uh, like a normal wolf poking out of the, the brush on the other side of the stream. And when it realized that the, the guys had seen it, it came out of the brush and it was this massive wolf on, mm -hmm. on four legs. Yeah. Uh, but as they're observing it, it's, it stands up on its hind legs and this green mist comes over it and it starts to, to shape shift somewhat. And uh, the, you know, the paws changed to more human-like hands, and it's just this frightening experience these guys had. Of course, it sent them running. Uh, but, you know, this is this green mist thing, that's something that crops up again. Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, that's a one-off. Well, no, it's not, no, because it's there right. are other cases, you know, where people will say, oh, they saw this weird green mist that came up out of nowhere, and then something happened when it did. So, you know, what is that? What's, where's that effect coming from? Yeah, and I was going to say one thing that, you know, I think we talked about on our last show about whether one, the, it's, is it demons, uh, dimensional, or is it, you know, uh, aliens. You're talking about Sunday show? Sunday show, where we talked about whether it's demons or aliens, but I also add on to their dimensional. Because it was e aliens, angels, demons. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, like, I think, like, one thing about having these different classifications is that I think it's a bit foolish because you're old, you're kind of taking one step uh, forward before you really got the basics down because we have to be able to understand exactly where they come from before you're able to really uh, identify them as to different types, I think. Uh, you could be explaining the exact same two species as, as the same when one comes from the dimensional and then one comes from outer space and then they have entirely different, you know, uh, uh, what is it? behavior uh, attributes attributes and behaviors because of that fact but because they have you know similar body types you would just think that they're the exact same so i, I think before you can really identify them by uh, types you have to figure out exactly where they come from and that's what the i think the next step forward would be i mean that sounds stupid as heck well you would think that but Human nature, though, uh, things are always going to be classified. That's right. I they think so. And, and I think like that. You know, there there are always going to be preconceived ideas because you have to look at the the cultural influences, the regional influences. Uh, you know, a Hispanic guy sees a, a bipedal wolf. You know, he's probably going to say it's chupacabra, you know, or, chupacabra yeah. or El Diablo, or mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> something that kind of fits you know whatever part of the sure. world he's from. Yeah. Um, you know, a devout Christian might see it and, and say that it's something of the devil, yeah, you know, demonic, something demonic. Yeah. So you're always going to have those extreme reactions, but then more importantly, you have to look at the very subtle uh, 
the very subtle influences that are there within any, any person's life. And that's mm-hmm. part of what I was talking about. If, if, you know, you, someone has a, an encounter and they immediately go and start researching, trying to figure out what was this, you know, they're going to put something in initially that leads them down a particular path. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're going to put in a werewolf or they're going to put in dog man, or they're going to put in, uh, you know, hellhound. You know, and and any of those paths is going to lead them into a a direction that's going to shape their narrative, Mm -hmm. whether they want it to or not. And you can have the most honest person in the world, but if they're getting all this input before they've really chronicled what they've experienced, then they're going to there are going to be subtle changes in in what the real encounter was. Yeah, definitely. And and I I think also um, one thing you have to uh, remember is that. you, a lot of these, uh, when you do that, is that people are then uh, get stuck on that idea of what exactly it is, and they become so hard set on that idea, it, or what they, what whatever they shape their encounter into, they kind of stop like pushing forward into what it could become, or what knowledge could be learned from uh, improving on it, or, or that that encounter. Or what what could knowledge could be extracted from just leaving it chronicled exactly how you remember it and not having that extra input from outside. And I think that's what really I, I worries me is that people become too hard set on what their encounter is instead of uh, what it actually was. Like, yeah, well, what do you mean? Like, they, like they they become hard set on the parameters set by uh, you know, well, I, what whatever I mean, region they're from or whatever cultural aspects. That, well, let's say like exactly like let's say you saw something on all fours and uh, you think like okay, all fours. So you you start going into hellhound and then you get stuck into this where okay, it was a hellhound. You're you're like oh okay, uh, okay. I'm gonna say something right there. I'm like, kind of okay, rambling a little bit, but yeah, you are. But but it's okay. We all do it. Yeah. Look, Anthony. Where we're from, like when you take the legends of the Hidalgo dogs, you're you're sitting there going like, what what is what is this? Because some, they, a lot of times the, the stories, and we just went and took a bunch of pictures in those areas where we got the reports uh, for my book, and we were over there all day. It was an all day thing going around my hometown and the region around there taking photographs. Um, but when you look at those creatures. They're on all fours a lot of times. People just see these black hellhounds on all fours. But then you take the case that happened to the three boys that, that actually I, some of them I went to school with. But they they saw these things go across the road, the black dogs, but they stood up on their hind legs. And they were speaking, like literally moving their mouths and talking Spanish. Hmm. And then they stood up on their hind legs. And that that was a legend that we were told as kids – of these black dogs that they would actually walk around on their hind legs and stuff. And I had heard of these before I saw what I saw. But when I saw what I saw, my thought of these things was this is a quote unquote dog. It's what it is. It was the Cadejo. The Cadejo is just a black dog. It's all it is. It's just a black dog and it's evil. But from what I was taught was you don't have to really fear it so much as like unless somebody put a curse on you. Now, if somebody, you know, put something on you, they threw a curse on you, then you have to be careful because somebody may have, you know, decided that they don't like you or they're soloso, whatever, jealous, and then that thing attacks you. So a lot of times when the black dog would come out in these stories and legends, it would pinpoint accurately go after one individual. And it would do what it did to that individual, right? But the you know this is a great example of something that is is uh, is a universal belief because you go to England, you've got black shuck. Uh, you go to the American South, you've got you know the American hellhound. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got you know the black dogs that you're talking about. You find these black dog legends all over the world, oh, everywhere, and it's it's a good example of how. Uh, the lore of different peoples have kind of melded together and shaped modern traditions and, and how they continue to evolve because, you know, this is, this is a story that has woven itself into culture and music and everything else. I mean, anybody know the story of Robert Johnson? 
Oh, yeah. The you know, American, Heck yeah. American yeah. blues yeah. singer, you know, yeah. who wrote a song, Hellhounds on My Trail. Mm -hmm. You know, and the whole idea there is that he made a deal with the devil and the hellhounds are coming to get him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go all the way out to the uh, southwest and you get stories of black dolls, but a lot of times they're seen as, as skinwalkers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so they're shapeshifters. They're, they're humans. They're evil witches who can transform into a black dog. And it can be on all fours or it can be bipedal. You know, one of my favorite accounts from around Skinwalker Ranch is uh, the guys who saw these two humanoid figures with dog heads smoking cigarettes. Oh, yeah. Like they were on a break. You know, it's just a smoke break. So, break. you know, what do you do with those things? Well, those are all those are all stories that are weaving together from different cultural traditions, I believe, and shaping our narrative on a subtle level. So, you know, that's those inputs that I'm talking about. You just don't know. If you start exploring which way you're going to go once you go down the rabbit hole. Well, so, you I know, mean, even just vampires. Uh, oh, I mean, my God. They, they can also, I, I've been told, to transform into black dogs well, and they have yeah, control over. That's another thing. So it's like, how do you know that these hellhounds are not just vampires transformed or transformed. whatever? I was going to ask you, David, about that. There are stories that in, in the Romanian and Moldavian in particular, mm -hmm. okay, the Moldavian story that I was given by a Moldavian woman, she actually said that when a vampire or when a, when a werewolf dies, it becomes a vampire. Mm -hmm. So she's like, I, cause I asked her, I said, how is, and she was the mother of a, fr a friend of mine that was Romanian and she used to work with us. But I asked her point blank. I was like, we ate dinner with her one day. She cooked for us. She wanted to make traditional Romanian food, whatever. And I was like, I'm going to ask you. I picked her brain. Cause she was real into the paranormal and everything. And I asked her some stories. And I said, you know, because she's all into the vampires and werewolves. And I said, how do you become a vampire? Because I asked her to become a werewolf. And she's like, well, you get bitten. According to them, you get bitten. But there again, and, and I'm going to say this. This is This is interesting. I'll start with the werewolf, okay? What happens is it is also a curse. A curse. You to can them. be cursed yeah. to transform into yes. a wolf. That's and so right. someone sends a black dog, mm -hmm. which never really trans. It it's not, doesn't have to be bipedal. It's just a black dog, like That's a right. devil, and it bites you. Then you're cursed with that of becoming a werewolf. Mm -hmm. Then it gets, it gets worse because if as a werewolf, according to the Moldavian, if you don't repent and do all this – stuff you got to do right mm -hmm. then you die and you become a vampire right <laughs> and so yeah you're that's, going that's like correct. oh my gosh and so it all starts with some kind of curse uh mm -hmm. from a black dog that bites you they, so so if you were bitten by a black dog everybody's like ooh, you know and then they they have to do this kind of cleanse and, and then you have to try to try to fight the, the inner beast or whatever mm -hmm. and it's almost like you're fighting against your own instinct because slowly you become an instinctual creature and then you can end up that way permanently and if you're permanent that way then it is literally to them now this is what she said it's like blasphemy because you can never repent right. so then you die and then you're cursed to be a vampire which is a an empty vessel of like demonic oppression mm -hmm. according to her and it was very dark when she was telling me this, I'm like eating, going like, wow, this is a buzzkill. Because <laughs> I'm sitting here going like, I go outside, and no no, no lie, we went outside, Scorpion's in the chat, I know he remembers this. We walk outside, and what do we see? A black dog. But it's a little one, you know? Yeah. It's not like a big hulking black dog, and I was like, oh, no, it's a black dog. <laughs> Don't let it bite you, because then you'll ultimately end up going to hell after you're a vampire and a werewolf. And But it all starts with this black dog curse, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, oh man, I mean, vampire lore, that's something we could talk about all night because it's so diverse around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got Asia, they're completely different, Eastern Europe. And of course, now we have, you know, the common perception now. That's that's another great example of what I was talking about earlier. You know, you say vampire to most people now, what are they going to think of? That maybe the sparkly things from, what is it, Twilight or something, you know? Well, that's a far cry from original vampire tales. You know, they were... They were seen as being, they were essentially bloated corpses mm -hmm. that had come out of the grave, <laughs> you know. So they were really, they, they reeked, they were really hideous, and, you know, they were literally dead things that mm -hmm. had been reanimated. But, uh, you know, that's that's an example of lore that changes over the years because then we get, of course, Bela Lugosi in, you know, the 1930s who transforms it into this 
you know, elegant, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, good evening guy. With like, a takes his tape, time you know? killing you type thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's Whereas right. in the Eastern European, they don't do that. Right. Uh. Yeah, they just so, after you, that's it. So it's a great example of how the narrative continues to evolve due to our cultural influences, our beliefs, and everything else. And, you know, I think we can apply that to, to Bigfoot or Dogman or anything else. I mean, kind of coming full circle, you know, all this Dogman stuff, uh, you know, some of my colleagues and I, you know, talk about this and, and the fact that this has really risen up in the last several years. You know, mm -hmm. uh, of course, our, our dear friend Linda, who's not with us anymore, sure. you know, uh, wrote about the beast of Bray road and we get all these dog man reports from there, but it kind of, it just took off in the years after that. And it, and in recent years, it just, everybody's talking about dog man. And, you know, I, I know some of those guys get offended if you use the term werewolf and it's like, well, you know, this person is describing a bipedal humanoid wolf to me. That's a freaking werewolf. Yeah, because that's know, what the I, word means, man. Whatever, yeah, yeah, whatever you want to call it. You know, if you're happy calling it a dog, man, you do that. But, you know, we're talking about the same thing with different names. Yeah, and, you know, that's like Sasquatch. Okay, like when you take the term dog, man, it came from Michigan. Mm -hmm, it yeah. was just one region. That's right. My brother said that. And that's how I, when he, I was researching werewolf. He says, "Stop researching where we'll look for dog man. Maybe that'll work. Maybe you'll get some some answers." You know, mm -hmm. he's lived in Michigan with his uh, mother and stepdad. So I thought, you know what? He's my half brother. But he said, Let, "Let's let's look at it from uh, dog man. Maybe we'll look that up." You know, because he, he knew about the legend. And sure enough, I, I see these this dog man stuff. You got Linda Godfrey, then you had the the show Dog Man. You know, whatever. And I I started going down the rabbit hole like what what is this this is not because i had never heard this term before i didn't know what that was when we were kids it was just and, and see my only my only problem with that is that people get hung up on labels it's kind of mm -hmm. i think you were trying to go in this exactly, direction yeah. earlier so people get hung up on labels and they end up losing a lot of the data mm -hmm. okay so if you're adamant that these creatures are called dog man and that's it and that's all you want to research you're going to miss a whole lot of information because guess what? You go back to the colonial period of America, nobody was talking about a dog man. <laughs> if they saw something like that, what mm -hmm. was it? It was a it's werewolf. A werewolf. Now, these, you know, I've got these stories in a lot of my books. You know, Indiana has a bunch of werewolf stories. Georgia, you know, all over the U.S., early stuff. Uh, one of my favorites, of course, I haven't done a Pennsylvania book yet, but I dug up this account out of an old uh, folklore journal out of Pennsylvania that at one point loggers working in this, uh, working up in the mountains, their wagons were being plagued by werewolves. So they painted hex signs on the wheels to ward these things off because they couldn't get the timber down the mountain. These werewolves kept attacking the wagons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are people, you know, they're French, they're German. They're all these immigrants that came from European countries with a very, Rich history. Rich history, uh, a, a body of werewolf lore. And they knew exactly what these things were, mm -hmm. you know, in, in their belief system. So that's what they were calling them. And I think that, you know, you have to you have to kind of set some of those labels aside a lot of times and start exploring and looking at things from a, a broader perspective to really get a more of the bigger picture. Yeah. One of the things I think is funny years ago when I was a kid, we were watching uh, some movie. I don't remember what it was, The Lost Boys or something. And I guess, and we had just, like I think a couple summers before that, I had seen The Howling for the first time because it was on TV. Oh, yeah. And it, it scared me to death. And I, <laughs> so I never liked werewolves or any, nothing like that. I never wanted to think about anything like that. So I went out and I played all the time out in the woods. But as a kid, so you're saying you wanted to be a lost boy, not a not a, <laughs> oh, okay. not a werewolf. No, no, no I, I never thought about any of it. I just because it, it was scary. Some of it was scary, you mm. know. And like like not all of it, but like Salem's Lot. Right. As a kid, that scared the crap out of me, and then the howling scared the crap out of me. But when I was out in the woods, I had read a book, and I think it was either Daniel Cohen or Frank Edwards or something. And I had read some book about Bigfoot doing something bad, and I, I was scared to be out in the woods thinking Bigfoot's going to get me. I never thought about a werewolf getting me in the woods ever. It never even crossed my mind. I just thought, well, as long as you don't go to wherever that place is in that movie, you know, that's in my mind, you know. So I told my dad after we had watched the movie uh, Lost Boys or whatever, and my dad, and I can't remember if we saw it like in the theater or what, but my dad said, he goes, 
um, did that scare you? And I was like, no, I'm not really scared. I was like, I think, I think it would be scarier if they were werewolves because mm-hmm. you know, I remembered the howling. And so I asked my dad as we're driving and my mom and dad are in the front seat and my sister in the back, you know, and I, and I, I, I said, dad, what would you be more afraid of a vampire or a werewolf? Cause me and my sisters were arguing. Right. And my dad, what you're talking about, cultural biases and stuff. He goes, well, heck, probably a werewolf because this is going to jump on you and rip you apart. He goes, the vampire is going to stand there and mess with you because he's thinking <laughs> the vampire is like Bela Lugosi. That's right, yeah. Yeah, but but if we were in Eastern Europe, who knows? It'd be a toss-up because both of them come at you and rip you to shreds. They don't right. go, oh, I'm going to do this and that slowly. Right. There's none of that. you know. And then there's not this long, drawn-out transformation either, according mm-hmm. to the stories that I've gotten from people that have seen these things, um, it's pretty quick. It's not like it's some long, Mm -hmm. and they're doing all this popping and locking and, you know, that's not happening. (laughs) They're just, you know, they're not doing the cabbage patch and they're, it just boom. And then they're there. And then you get this green mist that sometimes Mm -hmm. popped out, you know, somewhere, um, that right there is reminiscent of gin activity. If you think about the gin, because there's a type of gin that is green. And it, you, and yeah. then, but then you kind of wonder. You go down the rabbit hole, and you're like, you know, there's actually fairies that do that too. Mm-hmm. You know, there's certain types of fairies in Ireland, in particular, and that's where your your wife is from. And there's yeah. a green mist involved. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So then it, it, you kind of go like, dude, what is this? And I've had people telling me that that's actually what they are. They're just, you know, they're choosing a form, but. That's not necessarily the case. I think there's too many different aspects and too many different cultural uh, that are colliding, you know. And so people here, they want to think that everybody uses logic to figure everything out. And so one of the things that's happening now is there's this big push to try to say that Dogman is just a flesh and blood creature and that it's that way living in the woods all the time. Now, maybe that's true. But what is the origin of this thing? That's the Mm -hmm. question. Like, where did it come from? Like, where did it, you know, because there has to be a start. I mean, you know, you got the story of King Lycan and all that. I mean. Yeah. But. I I think people are going the flesh and blood route to try to um, imitate the the approach to Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. You know, because I've noticed that there's a, there are a lot of people who are trying to follow the model of, of Sasquatch research, you know, uh, with, with dog man and, you know, forming research groups and all these different things. And that's fine. Uh, but you know, don't try to model your, yourself after a different phenomenon and say, it's, you know, we're going to do, do it this way. Cause that's how they do it. Um, you know, all of these creatures, uh, I, I'm, I'm not on either extreme. You know, I, I'm not a hard science guy like Jeff Meldrum who says, well, it's an undiscovered ape, you know, and I, I'm not on the other extreme where people are saying that, you know, flying saucers are dropping off hordes of Sasquatch that are all yeah. in mental contact with people. And, mm-hmm. you know, are people having individual experiences? Yeah, maybe. I, You know, I don't, I can't explain that. Uh, everybody's got their own story, but uh, I kind of, I kind of take a middle road approach and say, well, you know, there's plenty of, of indication from reports and encounters that these things are flesh and blood, you know, at least uh, during a lot of the encounters, but they're also doing things that we can't explain that we don't understand. And, you know, I throw in that term that everybody's, uh, a lot of the hard science guys are very uncomfortable with and it's paranormal, you know, which that's been co-opted in recent years. And now everybody thinks paranormal only means ghost, but you know, the definition is beyond the normal, right? Mm-hmm. So there are these Bigfoot encounters where these creatures are doing things that we just can't explain. And that makes it something very unusual. I think the same thing is true with dog man and a lot of these other encounters, you know, they're just things that whatever they are, we're not there yet at the level to understand how they're doing some of the things they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's probably the the, the biggest. Uh, I don't know how you say it. Um, roadblock, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know when, when it stymies research and it stymies talk. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you they they, they do this um, rationalization in their mind, and they think, well, what I saw was flesh and blood. 
But if anybody's ever lived in a house that's got activity going on, and you know that I'm actually mm-hmm. going through that right now, things will touch you. Things right. will do things to you. They'll manipulate things, and you'll be like, how can that happen unless it's a flesh and blood right. thing? Because they can move in and out, dude. Because they, they have the ability to see us. We can't see them. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. And I think what we're dealing with when it comes to the whole werewolf or dogman, whatever, I've said this before, I think that they are made of both flesh and blood and of the spirit. And, and what I mean by that is that the, and the word Nephilim has been thrown around like just it's been ban- you know bandied back and forth by everybody. But I do believe that's what we're dealing with. I believe that they are born where they can live. And Sasquatch, same thing. They can go back and forth between the densities. And I think that when they pop out of nowhere and people are like, you know, and I had this conversation actually with Barton last night. We were just we were just chatting. We were talking about it. And, you know, he said, dude, you know, how do you explain them just popping out of nowhere? Like appearing, you know, mm-hmm. like appearing in the road and. You know, Dogman, Bigfoot, all of the above, they do that. They just appear out of nowhere. One of the flying uh, humanoid sightings I got uh, near Tyler, Tyler, not Taylor, but north Mm -hmm. of Tyler, um, it was right there near the border with uh, Louisiana. And it was so weird. I guess it was in between Tyler and, no, wait, that would be Longview. Okay, it would have been Longview. Mm -hmm. But that area, you know, like they, they saw this thing swooping through the trees and the daughter in the back seat of the car, she said, and I haven't told the story on the show yet because I haven't fleshed it all out, but she said it looked like a vampiric looking creature. Like she didn't say it was a vampire, but if I said, well, if you had to, I said, ask her, what does she think? And she said, if you had to pick something, she would say it was a vampire. Right. But it didn't really look like a vampire, but that's as close as she could get. But the, the interesting thing is that it came out of a, a green cloud, like a mist, mm-hmm. and then it was just poof, and then it was just there. So maybe that's something, that green, whatever that is, I don't know what that is or why that phenomena exists or why people have seen it when they've seen fairies, uh, dogman, werewolf, whatever you want to call it, and now this flying humanoids. Why And why that particular color? Because I haven't gotten reports of blue mist. Right. You know, I've gotten silver and yeah. I've gotten you know grayish silver. And I have several of my colleagues have too. Now, another thing too, folks, I want to tell you guys, and this is something, the good thing about us all working together now is that I can just call you guys up, which I, I've been with that for a while. We're, mm-hmm. We've been friends, but working more to closely, you know, as, as more cohesive um, is that I can, I can throw ideas to you and Nick and, and Lyle and Ken and, and, and Barton and be like, hey, what do you think of this? You know, check out, like I sent you that report the other day. Right. And you give me your opinion, and you're like, and then you say, yeah, this is weird. I've heard of this before. Right. Yeah. Because if we're all just flying solo, then, then we end up kind of, you end up with one-offs. Now, Lyle, I was talking to him the other day, uh, speaking to him, and he, he had mentioned a one-off that he had, and it was really weird, and it was about a uh, a couple in a park who had seen like this thing that they literally called the devil. They said it looked like the devil. It oh, had yeah. He's mentioned that one to me. Yeah. Yeah. And he said it freaked him out. Yeah. He was just like, <laughs> what is this? And so to him, that was a one off. But when I go to Tony, Tony's like, we've heard this before. <laughs> you know, it's oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's not a one off to us. And then, and then the, I can I, think of a half dozen of those right off the top of my off head. Your from, head. Yeah. From the, uh, yeah, from the Delta, mm-hmm. you know, because, but then there's the cultural influence too. Right, because the devil used to show up at the crossroads. Well, People made deals. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 really ingrained in in the blues culture that came out of the Mississippi Delta. So you hear these old stories about uh, you know scratch, mm-hmm. uh, which is one or old Nick, old Nick. You know, yeah. some of the the terms on, of the devil, on. and he is seen as humanoid. Uh, you know, completely human, but but maybe red faced or with horns. You know, a classic quote devil image Mm -hmm. and it's like man that's like right out of some kind of classic art or something Mm -hmm. but this is what people say they are seeing so you know why is that and you know sort of going back to the whole green mist thing and this different phenomena because you touched on a bunch of different topics there i don't i wish some of the kind of hardcore science guys would would dial it back a little bit and I understand why they're taking that approach. Mm-hmm. And I think we have 
I think we have room within the field for all the different spectrums. Uh, but nobody's got it figured out yet. So nobody has all the answers. There are no absolutes. You know, we cannot absolutely say, well, it's a, a creature from another world or it's, it's an undiscovered ape because we just don't know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there may be there may be simple answers. You know, an analogy I've used a lot of times, I think I've probably used it on your show, is that, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of cases of these things just disappearing. Well, we can go to the extreme and say, okay, well, maybe it's, you know, maybe they're traveling dimensionally. You know, they're going through some kind of portal or something. Of course, that gets some people all worked up. But, you know, what I always say is that what if this creature has some kind of advanced camouflaging has part of its, you know, makeup, one of its abilities that just don't imagine the first guy that ever saw a chameleon, you know, he's looking at a, a lizard on a branch or something. Right. And all of a sudden he, he blinks and it's just, it's, it's gone, you know, or it's blended into the, the tree branch. I mean, that would be paranormal to some primitive person. So, you know, maybe these creatures are able to do that, or maybe it's some, form of infrasound because we don't even completely understand what infrasound does to the Mm. human body and mind. Uh, We know it has an effect, but there are a lot of degrees of those sounds. So, you know, maybe there's something these creatures emit that causes us to just not perceive that they're there anymore. You know, I think there are so many different potentials, but ultimately there's not, you know, we can't look at one singular answer. Um, Every once in a while in the field, you know, every, oh, I don't know, X number of years, somebody will come up with a grand kind of unifying theory that, oh, this explains everything. You know, it's all, it's all this or it's all that. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't agree with that on a personal level from my research. I don't think there's one singular explanation for all of this phenomena that we are experiencing. There might be some singular thing that causes it. Uh, you know, whether we're living in a matrix or whatever the heck is going on. Uh, but I don't think there's, I don't think we can say, well, it's all the gin. You know, you can look at that through the lens of what the gin can do and certainly say, well, technically they could do all these things. Um, you know, I was, I was really close friends with Rosemary Ellen Guiley oh, yeah. uh, for, for years. Big fan and, of um, you know, we talked all the time. We talked every couple of days. And she had at one point for a period of time, she became convinced that everything pretty much was the gin, mm-hmm. that it was all gin activity behind it. And uh, she thought they were completely sinister and very frightening because of the things that she found and discovered in her research. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we we talked about that a lot. I've done a lot of research on the gin. And you can you can say, well, look, you know, they can mimic – departed people's voices or appearances so they could be ghosts you know they can they can shapeshift they could turn into a human another human an animal they could turn into a sasquatch if they wanted to Mm -hmm. so you know there are all these different things that they can do and the whole classic uh weird mist that shows up now you're talking about the green mist which i've heard a lot of times usually what i find if there's what seems to be gin activity is this weird black smoke smoke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, is, you know, some people say it looks like black flames. Some people like say it looks like black smoke, but it's, it's cohesive. It's not dispersing like smoke would do. And of course the, the legends say that the gin were formed of smokeless Smokeless flame, flame. you know, which kind of conjures in the modern mind, I think some type of plasma plasma or something like that. So, you know, that's, that's what maybe we're looking at. Uh, that kind of gets into the whole energy tract of what the gin may be or what they were created from. However, uh, coming sort of back to what we were talking about, you know, to, to try to say there's one singular explanation for all this phenomena, I, I think that's very restrictive. And, you know, we're probably, that's not the way to find answers, I don't think. Uh, I agree with you, but, and this is something just because I noticed that you, uh, you, mentioned the cultural differences and how you kind of keep finding that similarity well one thing that i threw to wolf on sunday when we discussed uh angels aliens or or uh, whatever is that do you think what came first the myth or the the cryptid 
So I was, I, I said, um, do you think that maybe these things are demons that when they see playing on what we believe, they, playing like they see us make these creatures and these cryptids, and they they us. instead embody that and say like, oh, I can't, prov- I can't make a form myself, but I can take what you make and turn that into a, an actual thing and use that as my form while I'm in the physical realm. And that's why I just I don't I don't believe it personally myself. But do you think like that's what I kind of threw to him like what came first the myth of the creature, you know? And and I think that kind of has a little aspect of maybe that's why that green mist is. It's like that's kind of like them going back into like this formless realm where like that they have to focus their energy into that being, and that's how they create those things. Like I said, not, I don't believe this, but it was just something that kind of came to me when we were discussing this on Sunday. And I, I kind of just another theory that you won't really know about if you kind of close your mind and kind of just put yourself into a box of like, this is exactly, this is the only way that these things can be found. So you, you, you weren't, you, you weren't, you didn't sit in on the Garitano. I, I didn't. Me and Chris get into that. That We, we started, what, I think more so in the next episode, right? On this Thursday one. Next Thursday, me and Garitano, because we were going into the whole, what came first, the science fiction and the and all the figure or this was it is it based on or is our notions of, of what we learn from science fiction like the reptilians? Is that what's giving us the idea? Somebody watches V and then they're like, I saw a lizard person. Or is V a, a collective subconscious somebody making that based on what we all believe is right. really there? Howling being the same thing. Somebody's like, Well, this is quote unquote what a because all these werewolf movies that are coming out with these creatures that look like uh, – I never was a fan of the uh, American Werewolf in London because to me it was just a big bulky-looking thing that ran around on all fours, and it was it was just weird-looking. Like it barely looked <laughs> like a wolf. It didn't – yeah, and so to me I always thought a werewolf should have been like something that was upright. But, but like going back to what I saw when I was 15, I actually thought this isn't – this is not – you know, I thought that this was the black dog or something, you know, like maybe right. maybe that's what it was. But then it stood up, you know, and then I'm like, OK, this is not the black dog or does the black dog stand up? I don't know. Well, come to find out it it, it does. It's just different aspects of it. But sometimes uh, like the Moldavian lady, she said that they will, will actually bite you. Um but then you become a, like a different creature. You're not necessarily becoming the black dog. The black dog is just the biter. And then you become this hideous, malformed, whatever. Interesting what, what you said, though, about the um, – and I wanted to say this real quick. I think Barton is in the chat. Barton might uh, uh, type that in if you remember this. He had said something to me about some people having an encounter with what looked like a cartoon werewolf. <laughs> and it, it, it's interesting, right? Right. But I had someone tell me a story similar to that when I was working over at the uh, – w- there was a place called Garden Ridge. It doesn't exist anymore. It's now called like At Home or something. But the one off of 35 uh, and 45 mm-hmm. it used to be Garden Ridge, and they had shut it down. And so I had a, a, a person that used to work there with me doing security and told me that they had seen something that looked like a cartoon Big Bad Wolf when they were young. So when I was reading Barton's book, you know, prior to that, I had never heard anything like that. So I told this person, I said, dude, there's this guy, Barton Nunley, who wrote a book, and he has a case in there like that. Now, recently, uh, Barton, let's see what he says here. Two people, yeah, see? So he says in the chat, right, two people. So th- there was, you know, B- Barton's story. Barton, if you could give me a little more information on that or who that was or what that was, because that's interesting. Because And, and what, it, what it connects to with what you were saying is about Bigfoot walking around with a caveman club. Right. You know what I mean? Because yeah. that's a preconceived notion that this is some sort of prehistoric throwback and whatever, and it just happens to be carrying around a Flintstone club. And pe- before people laugh... People but that's not a normal things. part of the paradox. No, no. That's that's the thing. If you say Bigfoot, you know, people have the same image all the time mm-hmm. now, right? It's usually basically the pat, the you know, Patty. Patterson Gimlin. Yeah, right. Patterson Gimlin uh, image of of Patty. So, you know, that goes outside those boundaries, and and that makes it kind of strange because, and and actually, that probably makes it all the more it makes it all the more interesting to me because these people are seeing something that. 
goes outside of the normal bounds, you know, and that tells me that, well, they didn't have any kind of influence, you know, that was, uh, they didn't run and look on the internet to see what Bigfoot looks like and describe it by that, you know, otherwise they may have forgotten the club. Uh, but you know, that's one of those things you can, there are scattered stories of Bigfoot carrying usually some kind of a stick, you know, sometimes like a walking stick or, you know, just a stick that it's carrying, like it's going to use as a club. Of course, some people think they, you know, they carry those because of the tree knocking. But, I mean, come on, a Fred Flintstone caveman club. That's just, <laughs> yeah. that's so strange. Yeah. But but it, there is a precedent for that, too. Because, right. like I said, you have the big bad wolf. And you're sitting there going, like, what is the big bad wolf? Well, go look at the cartoons. There you go. You know, and yeah. you'll see this, like, the face looks very cartoonish-like. And it's got these big feet. And he's like, ha, mm-hmm. ha, <laughs> You know? So Barton replied. He said that it was it was Martin Groves and and Daryl Denton. See now, Daryl has a very large and qu- gr- fast, quickly growing uh, Bigfoot uh, group. What is his group called? It's called. Uh, oh my gosh! And I'm an admin in that group. I'm I'm sorry to say D- Daryl is probably in the chat. He's got a huge group. Barton, if you give me the name of it. But they that is it's got like twenty something thousand people in it, and then grew fast. And there's some people in there that have all kinds of crazy stories. Hmm. But th- that that Barton um, gave me that story, and it's weird because like with with Martin Groves, he he's written two books about his encounters. He's a former law enforcement officer. Yeah. Just real quickly, yeah, you met. I him. remember him from last Bigfoot year. Yeah, last year at the conference last yeah. year. Yeah, okay. So, anyways, him and Daryl Denton, you know, and to come out, Bigfoot believers. There you go. To come out and, and, and admit that they saw something last October in the LBL that right. looked like a, a cartoon dog man, that, that's at the risk of hurting their credibility. Sure. But the crazy thing is there's a precedent for that. And people think that I'm that I'm joking. You know, th- this guy who used to work for us, um, I don't know if I should say his name, whatever. The, I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, was, his, name, his name starts with a D. He's a friend of ours. I, I, don't, I don't have his permission to say his name. He used to work for us. He said, and what his story was was that he was dreaming. That he and when he when he woke up, come out of this dream, he said like this big bad cartoon wolf character, like the like the cartoon whatever, was chasing him. He goes, dude, I woke up and I was like, whoa, and I was terrified. And then I kind of laughed to myself. I said, dude, that's a that's a funny. Why would I dream of that? He goes, I look over and I see it, and it went like this, and it came right on top of him. And he was like, oh, and then he stopped. And he gathered himself, and he was like, it was gone. He was like, there's right. nothing there. So it, it was like it came out of his dreams. So he was asking me, because I, I had been on this other show, you know, at that time. And he was like, what was that? And I was like, dude, I have no clue what that was. I mean, right. like, what what are you, you know. And and, we're, and the property was pretty creepy. It was a big abandoned building, you know, that was there. And they were, they were getting ready to tear it down. And I remember, like, walking through the building or whatever, and right after I had relieved him to go home, that after he told me that story, I heard footfall behind me in that building, and then I heard something like a cough, cough kind of a cough, or mm-hmm. clear, uh, someone clearing their throat. Right. So I, I was like, what the heck was that? So I go to use the restroom, been in that building 100 times, never had anything happen. It, it's kind of unnerving being in a large open building. Sure. You can see clear across, you know, but whatever. I go to use the restroom, I come back out. And I hear almost like what I thought was a, a laugh. And I was like, did I hear that? Or was this because this dude told me this story? So I kind of rationalize it like everybody does. And I just thought, that's not paranormal. I'm just, I'm hearing stuff. Never happened again. Like every time I went to the restroom there, it was in the back of my mind. But it, I never heard it again. I never felt it again. Never had anything happen. But the fact that he told me that story, you know, and then I had told him about Barton and Barton's book. And I think he, subsequently, I think he went and read it because we talked about some of the stories in the later on. So I know he read it actually, but I told him, I said, go to, go to Amazon and buy this book because I've read it. Um, not the best choice of places to read. I read it in an abandoned apartment complex, which was <laughs> scary. Cause remember Anthony, that dog out there would howl like ungodly throughout the black? night. It, it, <laughs> I don't know. Did you ever see it? No. What, what it looked like, you know, I don't, can they, I don't think they can hear you. You know he's not mic'd up, but anyway, it, it it wasn't a black dog, but it was across a creek, and then in the middle of the night you'd hear, and you're like, 
you're sitting there reading all this scary stuff in this book, you know? Wow. And I thought, well, this is probably not what I need to be reading while I'm out here. But I told that guy that used to work for us, I said, look, man, you're not crazy. You know, there is a precedent for it, but why do people see that, you know, because of our beliefs, you know, the way they, what, what goes on in our head. Maybe as a kid, he saw a cartoon and it scared him as a child. You don't even remember it. Right. And then this thing thought, I'm going to scare him with this. Now, going back to what we said about the jinn, let's, let's get into the green mist thing. Here's they, they come from a place, according to the, the, the lore, it's called the calf, mm-hmm. right? Now, they say that the calf is surrounded by green mountains. Right. So we don't really know exactly what that means. Does that mean that their realm is the atmosphere of their realm is green. I thought it was it was interesting because Venus, the planet, is green mm-hmm. because of the gas in the, in the planet. And so I posed a theory one time in a group, and of course, some people, uh, some some Neanderthal brain people, they're like, "That's so stupid! Or why would you tell them if they're from that planet?" You know. Well, it would make sense because if you can come through a portal, what does it matter if you're a million miles away in another planet? Right. You know, you're using a stargate to come through back and forth. Now, if their atmosphere is, let's just say, for example, it is the planet Venus. Let's say that they live there. Let's say that that's where they come from. Um, and, and they they enter into a portal. Wouldn't there be a green mist that would come through if their atmosphere is made of green mist? Um, that's funny while I'm saying that, too, that green light's going up. But it, it it would be it would stand to reason. So I just threw that out there as I didn't say this is what I believe, but I got ripped to shreds in this group. They were just like, "That's a stupid, that's so stupid, blah blah blah." The planet Venus, ha ha ha. And I was like, "Well, you know, the planet Mars is red. You know, um, the planet Venus is green. I mean, you know, maybe that's that could be why we see it that way because their atmosphere is so. If they come through a stargate or a portal." What's going to come behind them is going to be some of their gaseous whatever. Um, it's no more ridiculous than any of the other theories that we've been, you know, bandied about, you know. And so I thought, why not, you know, say it? Um, and of course, it didn't wasn't received well. Or but the I, mist could be a residue from from something that's interdimensional. And mm-hmm. you know, it's it's funny because if, if you go back to uh, look at traditional cultures from around the world. You know, one of the things, I talk about this some in Strange Intruders, uh, one of the things that I have found all over the world, you have traditional cultures who talk about other beings that used to live here among us. Mm -hmm. And at some point they left. Now, again, the different, uh, you know, the different biases or the different things that people are looking for to, to fit the narrative, right? You know, in recent years, you got all the ancient alien people saying, uh, well, yeah, they were here, and then they left on spaceships. Well, maybe they did. I don't know. But if you look at what these people say, what traditional cultures say, they talk about this other race of beings that lived here among us, and at some point they leave. And it's usually through a doorway or a hole in the sky or a hole in the mountain or an opening in the ground or something, right? Right. And, you know, that says to me, that's some kind of dimensional opening. And I've been talking about this stuff for decades because of learning it from different native elders. Uh, Only in recent years has this become somewhat scientifically acceptable because now we have the quantum sciences saying, hey, you know what? We figured out there's 11 other dimensions of existence. We don't know what's there, but we know they're there. And, of course, my question has always been, well, just because— we can't get there <laughs> doesn't mean that what's there can't get here. Mm-hmm. And that may be exactly what's going on in some of these situations, at least, because, you know, these things that kind of blink in and out of existence, you know, how exactly is that happening? Well, if they're coming through some kind of a, a portal that we don't fully understand that's between dimensions, you know, then they understand how to access that. We you know, it's a point that we don't understand yet. Well, and, here, I was going to say, they might not even understand how to access it. It might be something that just happens accidentally, like naturally forming. Like uh, I was speaking before. I, well, I would disagree with that to a certain degree because there's too many there's too many cases where these things, they, they show up and then they leave yeah. as if they know how to, uh, or at least where the access point is. Yeah. 
or there's something in their nature that allows them to utilize that access point. Well, I, I was just speaking, uh, speaking about like maybe a situation like uh, time blips where we had uh, the gentleman who stepped out on the side of the road to use the restroom and then he had a saber tooth oh, tiger yeah. come at him. We, we talked about that when you came yeah, on yeah. the show. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was saying like, if yeah. that was the dimensional thing yeah. where like that saber tooth tiger was just God, in its natural habitat. Oh yeah. It went to go hunt and then all of a sudden it hit the boundary of the dimension. That was out in Las, and near Las Vegas. Then like that, it didn't, it wouldn't yeah. have control over it. It's just like, it was like a blip. Or in like, that, yeah. In that case. And that, that could be that's a few all different entirely things. what I'm talking about. Yeah. That could be, yeah, they could be coming through something, or or it could be just a, you know, I almost hesitate to open the can of worms, but some kind of rip in time or yeah, you know, yeah. window in time. Which because we've talked about that with the there's, devil's backbone. There's so many of these cases where people see, you know, I mean, there's people seeing T Rexes, yeah. you know, running by, and it's just it's there, it runs by, and it's gone, uh, you know, and and other things similar to that, uh, Confederate soldiers or yeah. you know, a, an old. Uh, an old prospector, you know, native on a horseback, yeah, you know, and things it, like that. And, and it's not like they're dead. It seems like they're just out of time, like out right. of place. Yeah. yeah. Like, but, so like that's like because mm -hmm. you've had those stories where like people say like, oh, I could tell it was a dead person. It just like they had this really weird energy. And then other times they say like, I had no idea. I like it, they were completely flesh and blood. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a whole different uh set of circumstances mm -hmm. that you're talking about in those cases rather than something that is, is necessarily a dimensional portal because, you know, in, in these cases and even what quantum science is talking about now, these are other levels of existence that go, you know, somewhere that we just, we don't know where. Yeah. We don't understand. Uh, and and science can't even get there yet. They've just figured out that those those levels exist. So, you know, the big question is what's there? Kennegan Jim says the friction of dimensions merging might burn some atmosphere at t and make a green mist. I don't know. I mean, there's. Well, you said yeah, earlier knows. that I think this is this two part comment because you said earlier that nitrogen burns green and nitrogen is mostly what's in the atmosphere. So that might be what. Well, is. we don't know what the makeup of those other dimensions is. Exactly. Mm, so that's exactly. what I'm saying. Like that might be what. And what the interaction it, is yeah. at that point. Well, it says it. Dick Richard says second heaven. Enoch explains it all. Well, also, if, if, you, if you look at the Quran and the Hadiths, mm -hmm. it says that the, that the jinn come from the calf beyond the green mountains. We don't really know exactly. We just know that that's where they live. And they, but it says, it also alludes to, which I think is the fifth density, because I think they're the fourth density. That's my opinion. People don't have to agree with it. But it's said that, that, they, that they're neighbors. They have neighbors. So, mm -hmm. like, we're their neighbors on one side, but then they have neighbors on the other side. And when it when it talks about that, and I had talked to a Muslim cleric, literally asked him this because he was very versed, and he was he's, he was a Jordanian guy, and he was, like, telling me, you know, he's like, it doesn't, the Quran doesn't translate well to English, you know, just like the Hebraic tradition. Don't, they don't translate to English good at all. No, they don't. So people are like, well, this is the Bible, that's the truth. Well, it is, but you're not, You if you don't know Hebrew or Aramaic or... It, it wasn't Arabic, written in English. It wasn't written in English, you know, and they didn't even write, you know, left to right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but that's a whole nother, I digress. But the, the point is, this guy said, he said, look, to, to understand what there's, what that those verses are saying he told me he was like you know you're going from one side of of the universe basically to the other right and in each realm there's a different type of being but the way that he described the jinn were they typically they like to pick a certain form and that's their form that they pick but that's not who they are <coughs> they wear a mask you know mm -hmm. and he said that it's it can be anything but one of the things that's very, 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 uh, and this is weird, it's like universal within the Middle East, or in the Levant in particular. They can't turn into wolves. Right. Yeah. There are lots of books and, and that say that they can't become wolves, which is really weird. And then they have this thing called the Nagwala or Nagala, mm -hmm. depending upon what, what region you're in. And that creature is actually a vampire-sounding mm -hmm. creature. It's a zombie that kills you, drinks your blood. Yep. And its enemy is this wolf-like creature, and that's the only thing that can that it's afraid of. But it can't. That can't be a gen because they can't become wolves, right? Yeah. And see, I 
I think that the jinn are interdimensional mm -hmm. because you know some of the holy texts say that uh, <coughs> they were they were banished, but they are among us still. Mm -hmm. So you know what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that they're not here on our level of existence, but you know theoretically other dimensions could be overlaid with ours. It's just that they're at a completely different frequency or whatever that we can't comprehend and, and we can't interact with on a regular basis. So, you know, I, I think that it kind of comes full circle when you start looking at that stuff and applying some of these quantum ideas that are coming out now about these other, uh, other dimensions that could explain where these entities went and how, they can still interact with us if they have the knowledge of how to get through, you know, and come over here, which by all accounts, the djinn seem to, you know, well, because the, they love plaguing humans. It definitely does sound like it. I mean, if you had to give me a description of a different dimension without directly being able to describe it, the, everything that you hear about a djinn is exactly what you would mm -hmm. think about. And uh, I think like that's like it, it put to words perfectly how, what, uh, and where a gen exactly is. And well, and one of the interesting things that kind of interacts with that is that, um, you know, first of all, most people from the Middle East, anybody who, uh, you know, practices that faith for the most part, they don't want to hear you say the word gen. No, no. You don't mention that around. It's, it's like mentioning skinwalkers to a to Navajo. Yeah. You know, they're going to shut you down because they say that, Saying that word, you know, gets their it, attention. it gets their attention and it brings their attention to you, which is the last thing you want. You know, you're essentially calling them in. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess we probably have some company in here at the moment, yeah. but, <laughs> well, not, you know, you know, by, you know, by that faith, if you're talking about the jinn, then you're putting the, the word out and sort of summoning them in a sense. That's the fear anyway. And that is sort of compounded with the fact that, you know, you talk about all of the, the Muslims that are in the world now at this point, uh, they, they all believe in the existence of the jinn, whether they talk about it or not. Because one of the tenets of the faith is that if it's in the holy books, you have to believe it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Allah talked about the jinn, therefore they are real. Yeah. So to a good portion of the, the population on this planet, the jinn are a real thing. So what does that energy create? Yeah, because you can create that. I thought about that too. Yeah. Belief, you know, like Shaolin monks creating tulpas of themselves. Mm -hmm. Biolocation. Tibetan you know, monks. Like, to, Tibetan monks, yeah. yeah. Um, when, you, when you go back, well, you know, and there have been... I read a story, and David, you're very well read. We've both read some of the same books, actually. There was a story of a monk, of it was a Franciscan monk, mm -hmm. and that he had been made as a tulpa, and that he was actually, it was it was like he was very real, but he was a tulpa, and I remember somebody saying he was running around on his property, and he was drunk a lot, mm -hmm. and I was like, how did this energy that was just thought up by someone, he gave it, they gave it power. Mm -hmm. And then they thought up the image of, of, a, of a Franciscan monk and gave it the abilities to move around and talk. You're probably, are you talking about the Alexander David Nail story? That might be a little bit different than what I'm talking about. You're talking about the one where they came up with the, uh, at the Boston College? Is that what no. you're talking about? No, uh, Alexander David Nail was a, a, a woman who, <laughs> she, I, I can't believe nobody's made a movie of this woman's life because well, she was us, yeah, she was sure. pretty amazing. Uh, she went to Tibet when it was the Forbidden Kingdom. Westerners weren't allowed in, let alone a Western mm -hmm. woman. But she snuck in. On multiple occasions, she got in, and she was just fascinated with Tibetan culture and went over and met all these high lamas in Tibet and ended up learning from them. And at one point, she, she had met an artist who came through the village that she was staying in. And this man, uh, he comes and visits, he goes away, and at some later point, he visits again, but this time he's, he's a complete wreck. He's, he's nervous. There's clearly something wrong with him. And she finds out that... 
he had been focusing on this particular entity and painting it so much that he had created a tulpa of it. And he was now terrified that this was happening. So she learns about tulpas, but she doesn't know what they are. So she goes to the high lamas and they explain that a tulpa can, is something that is created first in the mind and then it becomes real. So she asked for and is given the process to create a tulpa because she wants to test it. So she's in the mountains of Tibet. She's the only Westerner, you know, maybe in the country at the time. And she thinks, okay, well, I'm going to create a tulpa. What is it going to be of? So what comes to her mind is this jolly monk, like Friar Tuck style mm-hmm. monk with the robes and everything. Because that's the last thing you would expect to see. She's not going to mistake anything else for that, right? So she begins this process, and sure enough, she starts seeing this monk around this Tibetan village. And he has taken physical form. Now, the progression is that he starts to be a little bit frightening to her. Mm-hmm. And... The people in the village are preparing for this this trip. This whole caravan is is leaving. She's part of it. The monk follows them, and she's she's getting she's frightened now of this tulpa that she has created. So she goes back to the llamas and she says, "I don't understand what what has happened here." And they basically say, "Well, you've created a tulpa, uh, and eventually a tulpa takes on a life of its own." And it can become sinister. So she then has to ask for the process of banishing this tulpa, reversing the process, which she's given, and she does. But, you know, this story, so this story is, um, it, it's its in her book. It's uh, It's been chronicled in various other sources. But it, it's its an incredible story, and the, the whole idea is that the Tibetans believed that if you could create something first in your mind, uh, that there was a process of focusing on it so much that you gave it physical reality mm-hmm. uh, because whatever we perceive can become real if we apply the right amount of focus and energy. And that's exactly what she did, uh, except that in this case, the thing, the tulpa in this case took on a life of its own and started drawing energy from all over the place. And, you know, for whatever reason had a a sinister attitude towards her. So it had to be banished. But, you know, if you just imagine what happens when something is focused on so much, so extensively, I talk about this some in, in strange intruders in terms of the slender man, you know, because everybody, if you know anything about the slender man at this point, you know, it was a, a complete fabrication initially, Mm -hmm. you know, it started off on a forum and it's, for those who don't know the story, it started off as part of a contest. Uh, There was a forum called something awful. And this guy came up with an idea. He said, Hey, let's, let's come up with a, a paranormal themed creature or cryptid or something that we can make go viral on the internet. And people started submitting ideas of different, you know, like, animal like creatures and things like this. And then this guy comes up with this figure that didn't even have a name initially. And it was a very subtle, uh, it was a very subtle thing. Has it unfolded? He started adding to the idea of this thing. It was initially called the operator, I believe. Uh, but it was this weird figure that lurked in the background and had been present at these disasters. And, of course, they had a Photoshopped image of this, what we now know as a Slender Man lurking in the back of a a playground, for instance, that purportedly is before a a fire or something. And you get all these things. Well, it became so popular that other people on the forum started contributing to the mythos. And, you know, somebody fabricated woodcuts from the 1500s of the Slender Man. Uh, You know, there's all these different things, all this input starts happening and the form was virtually taken over by the slender man and all the focus was put on this what we now know is the slender man but independently outside of that people started reporting seeing an entity 
that matched that description. You know, Coast to Coast AM one night got a panic call from this girl who swore that she had seen this weird figure uh, lurking in her yard. And she described it, and it was the Slender Man. You know, it's this tall figure with extra appendages and, and no face. So coming back to the concept of, of tulpas, you know, what happens now with the advent of social media and the idea that a, a, a thought, an idea, you know, a concept can go around the world in seconds by posting it online. Now you've got people on a global scale all focusing on something that, you know, are they conjuring that into existence by mere belief or, or thought or something you said earlier, mm -hmm. is there some entity that is taking advantage of that idea and saying, well, you know, there's, there's, thousands of people now who are talking about this slender man figure and they're terrified of him. That's how I can manifest. Mm -hmm. So that's how this, whatever it is, chooses to show itself to people, furthering the cycle, furthering the fear. Yeah. Are you familiar with the Toronto experiment, the Philip Ellsford? The Philip experiment. Yeah. Philip, yeah. Philip yeah. Ellsford. And it, it was basically a, a group of people from Toronto. I've spoken to a couple of people who were part of that experiment because wow. that was a fascinating, absolutely fascinating experiment. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a book, it's extremely hard to get, um, that uh, was written about the experiments, but the idea was that uh, a group of parapsychologists decided to try to create a spirit. And they they were using, uh, this was in the 70s, so they were using you know, Ouija board and things like that and mm -hmm. traditional methods of spirit communication that were popular at the time. And they created this entity, or this this uh, the spirit of this guy named Philip Ellsford, and they gave him a whole backstory. <laughs> And a lot of it is historically accurate, but they intentionally put in things that were wrong. Yeah. And he started communicating. Yeah. And started, bless you, he started answering questions. He started uh, giving members of the group information about things that were, were happening in their lives that he couldn't possibly know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really fascinating it, experiment that took place. Yeah, and, and, they, and they gave him a backstory like he was a spy mm -hmm. and that he had been— uh, Had a love affair. Love a affair. Failed, he had, failed love yeah, affair. Yeah. It, was a whole, it was a whole thing where it was like it, 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 it was really weird and like he worked with the king or whatever. He was friends with the king or whatever. And when they started doing like this seance— Mm -hmm. And they did a an old fashioned Victorian seance. Yep. He showed up, and it was like the whole nine yards, all mm -hmm. of the spookiness that occurred. He also I, levitated the table. He levitated the table. Uh, yeah. But that experiment has been repeated. I, th I thought there was Boston College one. There was one with other. success because there was one in Australia that followed the Philip experiment, and they basically did the same thing, uh, and and the spirit manifested. Uh, so it's been done a couple of other times under the same conditions and the same parameters and also met with, with the same success. So, you know, again, though, that's there's such a big question that, that sort of hangs in the air there. You know, it is, is the entity being created? Is it a tulpa? Or is it something else that is using that opening in order to come in and communicate with to people? To fill the niche. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, what do you think? I I don't know. I, I honestly think we're don't not know. Gonna know for a while. We're, 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 there's really and for a while. <laughs> we mean next week. <laughs> we'll find out next Wednesday, folks. Tune in. No, I'm just kidding. But I, I I don't know what that is. Somebody says Oxford College has degrees in witchcraft and wizardry. Now I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, there's you know a bunch of craziness going on. I I would look at it like this. Yeah. When, when I was a kid, when I was young, I had a friend whose house supposedly was haunted, my friend Randy. And, and we, I, I don't know if we conjured something up or we gave it some sort of power or what we did. But one of the things that I always wondered about that, that whole situation was we, like, we didn't know who was haunting the house. We knew that there was a ghost there and it was supposedly, it was haunted and it had been for years. I was like in middle school. 
And I just remember us sitting there talking one night and 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 giving this. We I think we gave this thing like some sort of backstory that we didn't. Know. We thought it was a female, and we started talking about how. She must have been killed by her husband or something there because it seemed like she, it, the entity didn't like men. <clears throat> and I believe his mother or somebody had seen a female, so we, we thought we just latched onto that. And then I started looking back on it over the years, and I wondered how much energy we gave it with our thoughts. Like how much did we provide this entity with a, 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 a way to be um, its own – Whatever, you know, like the energy we gave it, did it feed off of that and become something? And that's something I've always wondered about. I've always thought that that was. And, and to add on to that, uh, I've, we talked about earlier about how, you know, emotions obviously saturate the ground. and Blood and emotions. Blood and emotions obviously saturate the ground. Do you think that maybe. They saturate the environment, period. The environment, yeah. yeah. But do you think that, like, your ideas are then being that you're. Uh, that saturated emotion is then being used by your thoughts and ideas. And that is what's being formed into like this soulless being that kind of just roams around. And what we think are these beings and creatures that have these uh, inherent like light or, or, or souls or beings are actually just empty vessels. And that's what is what makes them so evil and so you know, disgusting is that they're, they in fact have nothing. They're in fact just uh, here, created Here's beings. what I'm going to say on that. And David, you can tell me what you think of this. But anything that's a copy of a copy of a copy is going to be warped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So like some people will say that God created the Anunnaki and this is going back to the ancient alien thing. And for argument's sake, let's say that they were our progenitors. I'm not saying they were, I'm saying, but let's say for argument's sake that they were. God created them. They created us. Then we're creating something else. You see what I'm saying, where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, be, it's becoming to where it's like, you know, we, we, we know this. Like, Anthony, when we make copies on the machine, like, if we take that copy and then make another copy with that, then that other copy and the copy with that, it comes out weirder, like, more. It just Well, it, like a cloning. I mean, cloning, that's, yeah. that's, you know, that's exactly what you're talking about because yeah. they try to clone a sheep or, you know, whatever – you know, a cow or whatever, it doesn't, the integrity doesn't hold up because mm -hmm. it's a copy of, of, you know, something that they can't completely replicate, at least not at this point. Maybe that's why we are what we are because we're, we're literally just copies because our progenitors, our ancestors, if you will, they were supposedly giants. They were large, you know, and if you look, and then I always talk about this, but if you go and you look at the Hindus, what they believe in is the Kali Yuga. Mm -hmm. And somebody, somebody, and, and, I, and I actually told this person, we had a little discussion in one of the groups I was in, and I said, they said, well, according to the Kali Yuga, we, the, 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 in the end of the Kali, by the, by the time the Kali Yuga, whatever, in the middle of whatever, toward the end, they said that everybody's going to be these stunted little dwarf-like creatures, and that there's not going to be, you know, there's nothing, that their lifespans are going to be very short. And I said, that's already here. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? We're not, I said, yes, we are. Because if you go back even to the Dwarpa Yuga, right, which Genesis mm -hmm. 6 is the Dwarpa Yuga, basically right. it's, it, it, it talks about there were giants. These, our ancestors, our predecessors were very big, very tall. You know, the Bulgarian uh, uh, Adam, when they were looking for Adam, mm -hmm. he was a 22 foot tall being, right? So when when you think of Adam as the the was created as the first human uh, uh, archetype, he was twenty foot tall according to the according to that story. Or I'm sorry, twenty meters. So like he's really mm -hmm. big. And then we're now we're down to what we, what would be to them these little stunted Smurf like whatever. I was like, that's already happened. <laughs> if you think of it in the terms of like you know our progenitors, our ancestors already, you know they're they're. And then I took it a step further. I said, now, if you if you go to the Kabbalah and and you read what it says about demons, that they are compressed beings that, that were from an alternate reality or, a you know, like a parallel universe and their universe was, you know. Think of it like this. The word universe doesn't translate to what we think of it in Hebrew. So when they wrote the Kabbalah in Hebrew, it doesn't go, oh, the universe. Universe just means world. Right. You know. And so what what I proposed to people was that the Denisovians could have been that. 
mm-hmm. because the deluge, the, the flood, crushed them. And literally all we ever find of them are teeth and bone fragments. Right. But we know that they interbred with the Neanderthals, which Neanderthals interbred with us. And Neanderthals mm-hmm. were very busy. They, they were interbred with everybody. <laughs> but, I mean, the Denisovian bloodline, it, it, it is the, these molars the size of, like, half of a fist. And right. you're sitting there going, like, this had to belong to a giant. Right. So are these the demons now? Because it says in Enoch that they would become evil spirits for all time. So is that? What we're dealing with, or or those creatures, this is something I've thought about a lot too. Are those separate from the jinn slash demons? Are they different? Are the demons like the Nephilim spirits, whatever, but that's not the jinn. Maybe that's their neighbors, or maybe there's two different things, or maybe it's the same. It's really hard to to fathom. And when you try to wrap your mind around it, you know, if you were just to sit there and you had the lifespan of one of these giants, like a thousand years, you could probably come up with some. A library of Alexandrian type, right? You know, but you can't because you don't have that, and all you have are people like like Plato who gives you a lot of good information. Anybody wants to learn, folks? People always ask me for a starting point. Biblically, I say start with the Bible and then just move your way up. But I would say read Plato. He talks about a lot of weird stuff. People don't realize how much esoteric there is there. And then if you if if you're like me and you're able to read. Uh, some of these manuscripts and not let it influence you, which you just read it and just, it's kind of a curiosity to me. Um, somebody said one day, and I might have been in the chat where they were like, oh, you read all this bull crap from all these different religions and you believe this, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I never said I believed it all. I said I read it. That doesn't mean <laughs> that I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, I just read a comic book. Guess what? <laughs> Spider-Man jumped off a building and lived. <laughs> that's That's very paranormal, folks. That's real. That happened. Spider-Man did that. No, dude. You can read something and look at it objectively and go like, okay, well, yeah, that's cool, but I don't necessarily believe that. But it's interesting. It's food for thought. Let's put it on the shelf, and then we can revisit it one day, and we'll come maybe come full circle. But everybody's perspective is different. Like for me and you, the devil thing running around is like old hat. But right. to Lyle, who's the Falk monster, Boggy Creek, yeah. you know, that's his wheelhouse. He's going to be like, that's a one-off. From him, that's a one-off. For me and you, that's like a 12-off. Right. Like we have a dozen stories of somebody running around looking like the devil um, because it's different. Our wheelhouse, mine and yours, is much uh, more uh, similar. Uh, it's very similar, right. you know, which is why when we have these conversations – and, folks, I used to call David, and I, we'd start talking, and I'd be like, I'm going to keep this brief, and David would go, yeah. <laughs> Famous words. We're gonna say it. he's like, "What time is it now?" It's one o'clock my time. So by four o'clock your time, we should be done with this conversation. And we would talk. Yeah. And, and in fact, I gave you the credit at the conference because you're the one that we were on the phone and you said, "You know, why don't you do a conference?" And I said, "Well, before the the COVID thing, you know, me and Ken had kicked the idea around, but then when the the pandemic hit, we 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 shelved it. And then a convert between a pair of conversations with you." I called Ken and I said, hey, I'm not going to lie. I was like, hey, man, let's do this conference. And then he's like, now you want to do it? Because before he had said, I said, well, I had, a, I had a conversation with a friend. And, and, I later, and then I later on, I said, okay, it was David. It was his idea. But And so we ended up like going and we did this conference. And, of course, you do a great presentation. And, folks, don't forget about the conference, by the way. Uh, if you go to, uh, what is it, Paranormal Roundtable Presents, second annual Dogman Conference um, on Eventbrite. Get your tickets. David will be a speaker there. I got, I had the, the the opportunity to listen to part of your because at, at the conference I was so busy I didn't get to hear anybody's anything. Right. I was just running around trying to you know. Yeah. But when when you were in San Antonio a couple months back when we all ate dinner with with Lyle and Ken our friends, and we all went to to eat whatever. Um, it was a conference put on by the Kling Brothers, mm-hmm. and they have a show. I think it was called Ghost Lab. Or something yeah. Like that. Okay. And so, anyway, we went to the conference, and there was some crazy stuff that happened. The Ryan Edwards almost died. <laughs> yeah. It was bad. That was, yeah, that he, was a story. He got his car <laughs> stuck on the railroad tracks. Thank God he didn't. Ryan's a good kid. But we we talked, and, and one of the things I was really happy is that I got to catch most of your presentation, mm-hmm. which was the first time that I had ever – um, got to sit down or watch it in person. Now, w- <laughs> when Daniel Jones sent me the zip file, yours and I think uh, yours and Nick's were the first two I watched. And I was like, I got to check it out because I hadn't seen your presentation in person. So, folks, if you haven't 
heard this man speak in person, you're missing out. And I'm not just saying that because because they're going to be at my conference. David's my friend. No, David does really good work. Your books are, are incredible. Everything you do is, um, gosh. And there's one state in particular. You know, I'm waiting for that one. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to say it, but there's one state in particular I'm really waiting for. Um, but your books, I think that in, in this last one, the main one I haven't read, the last three, I haven't read the Florida one. Um, the North Carolina is uh, really, really interesting. Uh, South Carolina. But I think that in Georgia, the Georgia one's good. Mm-hmm. They all, I really like the Alaskan one. That was like my favorite one. And I think that that one, but if you go back and, and folks, if you want to spend money on a good book, David's books are as good as any, if not better than most. I mean, um, I would give him the thumbs up, man. Like I said, my, my, my favorite book of all time concerning this subject, uh, not counting Rosemary Allen Guiley or Linda Godfrey, but living authors was Barton Nunley. Uh, his and Humanoids book was my favorite, but yours, your books, I can't pick a favorite. <laughs> There's a whole slew Appreciate of them. That. Oh man, you did. I mean, it's yeah. and, and me and my wife took turns reading some of your books, and we we're sitting there uh, like just reading them at night. And she was like, "Man, this is." So then, when you came over to the house and and kind of confirmed that yes, we do have uh, something wrong there, <laughs> you're like, <laughs> you're like something is wrong with this house, <laughs> and, you know. But it, we, we, you know. My wife was like, I can't believe we just hung out with, with David on his birthday, talking, and you know, and you celebrated your birthday, talking about uh, the devil's backbone. And I thought, when we first co- had a conversation together, I thought, man, this guy is on my level. Like you actually, or I don't, I don't even think I'm on your level, honestly. But you have so much knowledge. Like, and and I, I mentioned this to to Tony and Anthony the other day. I said it's a shame because when someone passes over, all that is there, you know. That's why yeah. you got to put it down on paper. That's what you were telling me, you know. And I was like, "That's very important that that is there." And it's a shame that some people don't read because if you don't read, you don't learn, right? You know. And you're a very good author. And also, like I said before, I wanted you to uh, uh, write the forward, mm-hmm. you know, for you know, for for my book. But I, I'm looking at like when I when I first embarked on trying to write a book, and I think back to what your wife said. She's like, well, you go and get somebody who's written before. <laughs> and a lot of people don't do that. They're just like, well, I, I'm a researcher. I've been boots on the ground, been walking around, you know, smelling leaves and stuff. I can write a book. I'm ready to do this. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 30, but I've been in the paranormal for 62 years. And you're like, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay, wow. And then y- you said it very well. You said, just because you can don't mean you should. Right. <laughs> and so you – Told me, you, you know, two years ago when we had this conversation, you said you you do very well at podcasting, mm-hmm. you know, and I appreciate you saying that you do very well at being an author. That's our wheelhouse. So when I decided that I was going to write, I had hours long conversations with with Lyle, Ken, you, Barton, people who've written books that I liked that I thought were successful authors, Nick Redfern, mm-hmm. and so it's funny because <laughs> I'm going to have Nick on the show in a couple of weeks too. But I had a conversation with Nick, and I said, Nick, and he's a very, he's a good guy. He's a mutual friend of ours. I love Nick. But I had a conversation with him. I said, Nick, I want to write a book. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I all, said, right. all right. All right. All right. And so <laughs> did, did you need some help, Josh? And I said, well, I don't really know how to start. He goes, well, the first thing you do is put the pen to the paper. <laughs> and he goes, or you type the words. And I'm like, <laughs> and, I was like and so I told him, I said, I've typed. You know, for my great bi- biography, I've typed a, a little <laughs> bit. He goes, well, go ahead and what do you just let me know what you got there. Let's see what we're working with. And I'm like, I was born July 14th, 1975. I said, that's all I got. I got nothing else. Well, can you help me with this? He goes, oh, you're going to need more words. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told Nick, I was like, and, he, and of course, he mentioned different people, you know, and he in your name. He was like, you know, you should talk to Ken, Lyle, and David, different people who've written books that are successful and, and have done, you know. So that's what I did. And so w- when your wife, when we were talking, at, at, at we were eating in dinner, and I just remember her saying that. And I thought, I, t- I looked at my wife, and I was so proud because I had done something that she had, she had told me to do. My wife's like, well, why don't you find people who've written books right. instead of just being another one of these people? And I'm not, I'm not calling anybody out on this, but it should have been a coloring book. 
right. you know, different people. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? I think you know? we've had that conversation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And you're like, well, I don't want my book to be something that a fifth grade, or a, a, a five year old should be just scribbling on because yeah. there's nothing there. And so I went to people who had actually written books, and you were at the top of the list. And so I am hoping that when my books come out, that they are you know up to par. And I know they're not going to be like y'all's because I don't I'm not a writer, and I'm the first to admit that. But I have like just just really put a lot of time and energy and effort into getting this done because it's something that I'm very passionate about, and I want it to be good. It has to be good because I'm not going to put something out there. And so that's why I spent all day. I know, Anthony, you probably you were tired. You and Zane, I drug you all over Taylor, taking pictures and doing whatever. Because I need that to happen, you know. Um, and, and, and I got Sibylla. She's mm-hmm. going to be doing the artwork for one of them. And then Barton's going to do the artwork for the other. You know, it's funny you talk about, about reading, though. And uh, I know a, a lot of people, you know, ask for advice. You know, I'm going to – I want to write a book, you know. I'm I, have any advice. And uh, I often ask myself, well, how much do you read? And I find that a lot of the people cranking these books out in the field now, they don't really read anything. <laughs> and it's and it's reflected when they when they put out books because they're putting out books that honestly, you know No editing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. N- no editing, no no you know, just Nothing cohesive about the book. I mean, it's just kind of – some of them are really bad. Some of them are just kind of ramblings. And I I mean, I started reading when I was pretty young and just read everything I could get my hands on, especially when I got interested in, in you know, strange things. And this is back in the 70s. This is pre-internet. So I wanted to learn stuff I needed to read. I, I didn't get it in a, you know, 120-character tweet. You know, that's not where my information came from. Um, so a lot of this stuff, I mean, I know we've read a lot of the same things. I, I read the Bible when I was a kid, front mm-hmm. front to back. And, in fact, you know, it's a funny story because I was uh, – my mother was carrying me to a church, you know, and I decided uh, after doing that a few times, I was like, I, I want to know exactly what this – you know, the, I didn't care for the preacher very much. I was like, I want to know what he's – talking about, you know, when, when he said this or whatever. So I started reading the Bible. I read it front to back and then set up a meeting with him because I had questions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I go in and sit down with him and I said, well, you know, I have a few questions, you know, because I've, I've been reading the Bible. Oh, that's nice. Nice that you read passages from the Bible. And I was like, no, I've read the Bible. And, and he couldn't wrap his head around that this here's this young kid that's read the Bible front to back. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I got to about the second or third question and he saw that I had all these written down. He said, the Lord doesn't let, like too many questions. You just, you should just read the Bible more. And he just keep, cause he couldn't answer some of the things I was asking mm-hmm. him uh, because, you know, he was stuck in this, I'm just going to do my weekly sermon and everybody will get the message and, and, you know, there won't be questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, that kind of spurred me on to say, okay, well, I'm not just going to read the Bible. I'm going to read all these other holy texts and all this other information. And, mm-hmm. you know, of course, I ended up seeking out elders from other different traditions that I could study with that don't have a written tradition. You know, it's all oral. Uh, but, you know, coming back around to that, I find that, you know, there's too many instant experts in the field now. There's too many people with... Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to criticize anybody in particular, because if you're interested in these things, more power to, you, you know, and if you want to know how to learn more, I, I say you have to read, you know, you're not going to learn it from whatever the latest paranormal television show is or something like that. <laughs> yeah, no you know, way. find find books to read from. And I'm not saying you have to read my books, you know, go read, you know, read Josh's book when it comes out, read Lyle's books, Ken's books. There's a lot of good material out there. And um you know, we do have some good, there are some good podcasts around now, you know, there's, there's a few that have great discussions that go in depth, like we're trying to do here tonight. And I think, you know, if you listen to those things, you'll hopefully get some answers, but maybe a lot more questions, because that's really what it's all about is continuing to ask questions and continuing to just educate yourself as much as you can every day. I mean, I still, I still read a, a stack of books a week. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, I've, I've done that since I was a kid. I have to be real honest here in the last couple of years, I have not been able to read like my quota for reading 
And Tony, you made this joke on the, on the show about, uh, well, not joke, but I mean, you guys talked about that list I have of books I've read. Yeah, you used to have a clipboard with a uh, paper sheet on it. <laughs> I yeah. do have to b back up and clarify something. So you you were telling me earlier. So if I read a, a comic, I can be Batman. Is that what <laughs> you're saying? Much... Yeah, that's the rules. Yeah. Awesome. You didn't know. Rules, that's, that's, cool. that's the new rules. <laughs> Whatever you want that you can read. That's what you you know. Because if you if, and now that you've admitted that you've read all these different holy texts, you're an apostate in every religion yeah. <laughs> because you've read more than one religion. Mm. I mean, I actually had somebody tell me that too. Like he was very—it was a college kid too, of all things. Just a few weeks ago, I was at the food truck, right? right. And he was—he was from India, and there were, there were four young men there, and one of them was very belligerent and rude. The other three were very nice, you know, whatever. He wasn't reflective of everybody from that region, but they were Bengali, mm -hmm. and he, he was being—he was drunk, and he was just like, he's like, well, my religion, if you're. If you're a Christian and you've been reading all those stuff, you're 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 a, an outcast. I forgot the word he used, and I said, and the other three were just like, just you know. And he's like, no, for real, man. You know, you could you could read it, but you can't be, you know, you can't be that, you know. And he was all drunk, and some kid, of course, drunk college kids. You should get lots of information from them, and absolutely and listen yeah. to them. Yeah. And and so I said, okay. And he kept, but he kept being so belligerent that one of his friends finally told him to sit down and grabbed him, and we were having this pretty intellectual conversation because there was a professor there from UT mm -hmm. and he was standing there in line with me and we, we were at getting shawarma and I just remember him and me and him were talking and these other kids started getting in on the conversation and asking questions about what we were talking about and we were talking about the, the yugas and we were because mm -hmm. you know, he's a professor he's from India and he so we kind of were talking and this one young man he just would not stop and you know, I, short of smacking this guy, I just did the next best thing. I just like ignored him completely right. and did not respond or give him any time or energy and anything. And the guy, the, the, the professor, he basically told me, he's like, dude, he's not indicative of how we are, you know. Yeah. He's like, and that's you know, and he teaches that religion. It's a you know, and he's like, he's like, how did you learn all this? Because most Christians don't, they won't even look at it. They, mm -hmm. He said, Muslims and Christians. And they, in particular, they won't even turn, they won't even look at Hinduism because they think of it as just this pagan, whatever. But I, I look at it like this. How are you going to learn anything if you don't read about it? Right. Because when someone comes to you and says, oh, well, you know, the Hindus have a, a character named Krishna, a colleague, that mm -hmm. sounds very much like Christ yep. because he's going to return and do all this stuff. And when that curve was thrown at me, I was able to answer that. And somebody says, well, how did you know that? Well, that's because they thought they were being clever or something. It's because I've read it. Right. You know, and then somebody said in the comments section, <laughs> it was so ridiculous. They said, so you've read books. Congratulations. And they're like, so you, you've you read all this stuff. So you think you know this information because you've read it somewhere. And I was like, wow, like how ignorant of a, of a statement is that? And I just, it, it's, I think, Anthony, you pulled the comment down, but I told you leave it because I thought it was so ignorant, you know, <laughs> that it was like, dude, you know, and then there was another one that came on the live stream uh, probably last year. What was it? The Amazing Dumb? Mm -hmm. When the guy goes, you amazing dumb. <laughs> that's like, so that poor guy got lampooned and I ended up like making up a <laughs> whole amazing scenario. amazing dumb. <laughs> yeah, so it ended up becoming the amazing dumb. And actually, I have it in my truck. It's a little backpack that somebody made me, a lizard-sized backpack, because I made a whole skit about it. Because I was like, dude, if you're going to call me the amazing dumb, at least use correct grammar. So you're going to insult me for reading, and you're going to insult me, you know. And then this guy that said that, oh, you, you, you learned that because you read it somewhere. I'm like, how else are you supposed to learn this? Well, you I know, mean, I mean, I, that's it's a big component of how knowledge is passed on. Right well, there's now. oral traditions, and yeah, it's so. Like I said, you know, books are or a are a component. Mm -hmm. You do have some traditions that are strictly oral, that are passed down, you know, generationally, uh, and then you know you have to add experiential uh, knowledge in there. You know, you sure. go out and, and and experience things, and I think that you know, particularly in the field that we're talking about, we have way too many people who. They what do they do? They they set in doom scroll on their phone, you know, through tweets, and you know they maybe watch paranormal shows or something. But and and their research is is googling something, and you know so that's their trifecta. Mm -hmm. You know I I just didn't grow up that way. I I mean 
We had to go to the library. <laughs> you know, I had I had to read. I had to go to the library. You know, I had to I had to get books wherever I could. Then I had to go out and meet people that you know were the predecessors, people like John Keel, who were out doing yeah. the investigations, and and then I had to go investigate myself. You know, and that combination of things, I mean, that's kind of, you know, those those are all part of what brought me to where I am today. And I still do those things. You know, we were talking about this at the beginning of the show. Yeah, I like to go out and meet witnesses and, and talk to them face to face when I can. And I like to see the locations that these things happen, you know, whether it was yesterday or 10 years ago, uh, because going to that spot will tell you something. You know, regardless of, of what the, the circumstances were. So, you know, you have to add in all these different components, I think. And, and you know, rather than, you know, sitting there and, and seeing if anybody tweeted about it yeah. you know, or whatever. Yeah. Or, so, or, or trying to find an article on Facebook or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Social media. Yeah. And, and th folks, I'm going to tell you something. And this is important to me. And, David, you know, y I think guys like you and our friends, you know, are, are you know, that's that's it. I mean, I I really feel like it's the last of a dying breed. That's going to be it because people aren't aren't reading like they used to because no. they just don't and they don't want to read books first of all. And then they they want to like when they do read something, it's very quick. It's very I want it now, you know. And so they have to. They don't want to read the story, whatever. And 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 it, it works in my favor, I guess, because I'm a podcaster first and author second when I become one. Because I'm not going to say I am until the, the books come out, and then you guys can be the judge. If you want to lambaste me, then I then I probably deserve it because my audience is very intelligent, and I'm the, I, I know you guys are smart. I'm not going to. I always say I have the smartest audience in, on the on the internets on the interwebs, <laughs> but I really feel like guys like you, David and Lyle and 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 Nick and everybody Barton. The last of a dying breed, because once y'all are gone, because you're seeing what's coming out now, these, you know, and there's a couple bright spots, but, uh, you know, it's not like it used to be, you know, and, and there's yeah. not a lot of good authors out there that are coming out with some stuff that's like, bam, this is really good. This is hit. It comes out, it punches you in the freaking head and says, hey, look at this, you know. Y'all's books, and that's it. I mean, you don't have a lot of it. I mean, you had like Brad Steiger, you know, I, right? He, Great guy. He, yeah, G G Rosemary yeah. Ellen Guiley, Linda Godfrey. They're all going away one by one, and you guys, you know, it's like we're, none of us are getting any younger. You know, I'm almost fifty. You know, I'm forty. I'm gonna be forty eight in a couple months. And what's gonna happen in twenty years? When when that's it? You know, the, this next group of people. They don't feel the need to even make it into a book. They put it on a Kindle or an audio book or whatever right. at best, at best. And you're not even getting a hard copy. Yeah. God forbid the internet goes down or, we, you know, we get hit <laughs> by a solar flare. What are you going to do? You know, I mean, it's going to be, you know, so, but podcasting, people want to hear the, 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 real quick and they don't want to. So now we got these things called shorts, which are literally just a minute long. Right. Because people's attention spans are like that of a flea, you know, a gnat. And so th they have to have these little shorts to grab people's attention because they just don't want to. And I would say that it it, it's because people are, are busy. But when you look at how many people aren't really busy, they're not really doing anything. Right. It tends to be the ones who aren't working and aren't really busy that are like, I don't have time to sit there and listen to. I got things to do. You know, like What? What are you doing that's so important? Because obviously you're just perusing the internet or whatever, or playing video games, and you know, th it, it doesn't make sense to me that they don't have time. But eventually... they don't have time for that. But they can comment on every other social media that's post right. that pops up on their feed, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, just sit there and go through days worth of of junk on the internet. So yeah, 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 and you're not getting good information. Yeah. And if they want information like what you just gave. Um, they, they think, oh, I'll just go Google it and I'll figure it out real quick, you know, and then you're going to get a dumbed down, watered down version of mm -hmm. what you're trying to relay. Like the story, like I knew part of it about the monk or whatever, but you just told it completely and brought it home. And that's something that I can, I can always count on with you guys is like, you know, my, my uh, colleagues, if, if I am stumped on anything, I can say, Hey, have you heard of anything like this? What the heck is this? What's going on with this? And mm -hmm. you'll give me a straight up answer. You'll be like, well, 
you know, and, 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 and it doesn't have to be, well, at the dawn of time, there was this, you know, <laughs> creature we called a Gugaway, and now we're going to talk about it. No, you just say, look, I've had cases like that. This is uh, an unusual thing. And then we just kind of go from there, you know, and that's, that is how you get things done. And there's these people, there's two camps. It seems like there's one that's this instant gratification camp that only wants to use, they want to look it up on the internet real fast. And then the first thing that comes up, that's what they put down. That's the answer. That's yeah. the answer. And then there's this other one that's like, well, I go out in the woods every week until I stink. And that's how I'm, I've learned everything by going out in the woods and getting, you know, diseases from ticks. And you're like, okay, that sounds awesome. Okay, great. You, you love it. It's good, whatever. But that's not going to – if wandering around for months on end out in the woods is have, has it yielded results? Because that is the question for me from a lot of people is like – if you're doing that, more power to you, but is it giving you results? Are you getting this? Because it's just as easy to sit back and get people's encounters for me and then retell them or have them come on and tell them mm -hmm. because I can go to the place where it happened, but the odds that it's going to rehappen is right. like getting hit by lightning or less than that. Right. Because I've revisited bunches of places where people have said that they've seen things. I didn't see anything. I mm -hmm. saw oak, poison oak. The other day, um, I was like, whoa, poison, you know, that's it. I saw a snake, and I'm like, dude, I'm more ch ch likely to get bit by a snake, a spider, or get poison oak than I right. am to see Bigfoot there. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you get all these, you know, so but those are these polarizing camps where when I deal with someone like you, and I'm not saying this for the audience, I'm saying this as a friend, it's so refreshing to sit there like we can eat dinner and we can talk about these things and we can exchange information and stories right. on on. Close to equal footing, because like I said, I don't put myself in your category. You got yours on me a little bit anyway. And you also, with with your what you've been doing, you've been doing it for so long. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And so it's like you have a lot of knowledge. You are a wealth of knowledge. And it's, But I can sit there and I can bounce cases back and forth off of you, whereas a lot of these people who are like boots on the ground, supposedly, you know, and they're like, well, I went out there, I didn't say anything, you know. Uh, you know, I went out there and I, I explored New York City and I didn't get attacked by a vampire or a, a, an alligator didn't come out of the sewer. So, yeah, I don't believe it. And that's that's <laughs> it. I mean, that's all they're going to tell you. And then you have, like I said, people that will write a whole book based on what they've Googled. Right. Yeah. And, and either way, it's not the correct way. Folks, th David Weatherly, wh what is your next project? What do you have coming up? What do you got going on? I've got three books close to finish at the moment, so stay tuned. There'll be an announcement probably pretty soon on the next one that's coming up. A couple more state books at least this year. Um, and this this crazy Dogman conference coming up in uh, September that, this, <laughs> oh. <laughs> that yeah. uh, I think is going to be a great event. Um, and I, I, I do a limited number of events anymore, mm -hmm. as, as you know, Josh. Uh, a lot of that is just by choice and because of timing and everything else. But, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I'll be at the, the Dogman Conference uh, again this year. And I think it's just an incredible lineup. Uh, Lyle, Ken, Nick, uh, Ron, Ron Moorhead. Ron Moorhead. Yeah, Chad, uh, Chad, just Lewis. Chad Lewis, a good friend of mine, yeah. Um, so, yeah, a great great group of people to that will be there. And that's Memorial Day weekend. I can't uh, remember the uh, it's Labor Day weekend. La I'm Labor sorry, Labor Day weekend. Yeah, mm -hmm. September. So yeah, I hope to see some folks out there and um, should have some some new books as well as the state books. And again, if you have stories about something you've encountered in your state, shoot me an email. There's a a link on my website, which is erielights.com. And uh, if you have any stories from the devil's backbone <laughs> and you know what that is, shoot me an email. I'd love to hear it. And one day you need to come back so we can just talk about the Devil's Backbone. Oh, yeah. Oh, There's gosh. so many stories from that region. You, yeah. you yourself told me the yeah. other day. What did you say that it rivals? Uh... I think I think it rivals areas uh, – like the Superstition Mountains, uh, Skinwalker Ranch. I, there, there's so many stories from that region, but you just don't hear about it very much. The Uinta Basin is what you were Yeah, there. yeah, Uinta Basin. It, that that yeah. whole, yeah, it, it is a very, it's a place of high strangeness. Mm -hmm. and we've both yeah. get, gotten lots of reports on that area. Yeah, and the stories go back decades. Mm -hmm. So, And I've done some shows on that, but since then, good gosh, man, I've gotten a, a ton of stories out of there because we've mentioned it and people were like, hey, I had something weird happen. I have the devil's backbone, and it and it does border 
Uh, one of the stories, there's a, there's a young woman that's going to come on our show in a couple of weeks. We're going to put it out there, and she's going to tell her encounter of what happened to her with a dog man, possibly bear man type creature. Um, and it's just right there on the on the border of the devil's backbone. That whole area is just an area of high strangers, like you said. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I've I've been to all the I've spent a lot of time in the Uinta Basin. You know, been on Skinwalker Ranch. I've I've been up in the Superstition Mountains. You know, a lot of these areas that are. Uh, you know, the native people in the region will say they're taboo. You don't go into them. The, there's there's tons of legends associated with them, you know, that they're strange places. And they have this very peculiar feeling, you know, to them. And th- the same thing is true in the devil's backbone. You know, it, it's it's the you place feel it. feels unusual. There's something off. There's something different. Yeah, I, I yeah. get this. We're just talking about it right now, and going having been in the haunted valley on multiple mm-hmm. occasions. Yeah, uh, I get this weird electric feeling down my yep. neck, and, and it, it, those Arroyo Canyons are haunted. Yeah, beyond. they are. Of course, we talked about the late Burt Wall, mm-hmm. and his yeah. books were very small. You know, they weren't real books, big books or whatever. But he had some information, and one of those, uh, uh, I can tell this one real quick, and then we'll shut it down. But this is a story I got from a bartender that used to work down there. His name was Aaron. And he gave me a story uh, that he, basically saying that Burt Wall, when he talked about this goat creature that had killed these people's cattle, mm-hmm. that he didn't feel comfortable actually calling it what it was, which was a goat humanoid. Right. Yeah, and that it was – he called it a goat, but it was actually killed by people, you know, uh, years ago, like like decades ago. And they got together, these ranchers, and they, they hunted it down into a cave, mm-hmm. and they killed it. But it was very much a goat man. Yeah, like it, was it was a goat man. Goat man, yeah. And yeah. it was murdering the animals. And, of course, you get Purgatory Road. You get all these stories about the goat, the black goat man. And then yep. the the cemetery there is haunted by a black dog. Yep. So you get all, and the then, hellhound down there. Hellhound, yeah. So yeah. you got all these crazy things that are going on there all at once. But, uh, folks, thanks to everybody that donated and everybody that's that was a part of that came to visit the show today. Um, we appreciate your, you know, coming on and, and, and paying attention to us talk. My guest, Barton, uh, uh, Barton, no, my guest, uh, <laughs> my guest, uh, David Weatherly. Well, I was going to say something because I got Barton on the, on the brain here and somebody had made a comment and Barton says, there's, there's a devil's backbone, uh, in every state. And, and yeah, there, yeah. there is. And there's one over there yeah. in Kentucky, but we're talking about the Texas one. And then somebody, and then right here, Barton says, uh, what does he say? He goes, I'm no legend, Kate, just a guy. Thanks for saying that. That's baloney. Barton is a legend, and David Weatherly are both legends, folks. And you're, you can see these legends at the conference in Fort Worth. I think that they're all legendary. Everybody that's on that lineup is a legendary person, or I wouldn't be dealing with them. I wouldn't be dealing with them. Um, if I thought that this man sitting across from me was full of crap, I'd just be like, that guy's taking pictures of towel racks. But he's, <laughs> but he's not. I've never photographed the towel rack. Just, the- just for the record. So. <laughs> and I don't think you would. I mean, because who would unless you're faking a Bigfoot? Um, but, you know, I digress. The thing is, you know, we don't know what all this is. We can't solve all the mysteries of the world, but we can we can talk about it. And David's got a bunch of stuff to talk about. We have pretty much every book uh, that he's written in this, uh, what is it, the uh, – Storage, whatever. So tonight we're going to do a giveaway, and if you if you want to win one of David Wedley's books, stay on there right now. Put the Will of Doom, or what are y'all calling it now? The, the Will of Broken Hope. The, the break, whatever it's called, <laughs> and put the names on there. And if you haven't won, tell us right now in the chat, hey, I haven't won. And Barton says, Dave is for sure. Yeah, Barton, the truth is, though, I'm a very humble guy, so I'm not going to throw my name in there, but I'm definitely a legend for sure. And that's because I'm humble. <laughs> It's like I said before, I'm the humblest of all the humbles. I can tell you that. Mike Turner, I see you in the chat. I hope you're coming to the conference, man. Fred Martin, all you guys. Uh, I hope you guys can make it, man. And Fred says that, David, thank you for being guest on Josh's channel. And Tyler says, I haven't won yet, but you spelled one wrong. You spelled it O-N-E. Tyler, you got to do better, man. <laughs> you spell it correctly, we'll throw you on there. Kate says, Josh, you definitely a legend too. Oh, thank you. Been listening to you since 2017 DER days. Thank you. Yeah. 
I spent years doing work on that show. Um, but you know, everybody who's joined us tonight, we really appreciate it. Ch Cherry says she, she's never won. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it says here, let's see, I should like to win. Okay. It doesn't say whether you have won or not. Uh, <laughs> your humility is resounding. Yes, I know. Yes. Thank you. Taylor Nemesis says she never ended up getting her hat. Who? Taylor Nemesis. Taylor Nemesis, if you never got what you were supposed to get, you need to email me at Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com. Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com. And that I will send your hat. What is the correct? Forthwith? How do you say it, Dave? <laughs> Would that be? Post, post haste. haste. I should have sent it to you post haste. Um, and Brett's, Brett Lafner says, I ain't won nothing yet. Okay. Well, Brett, and Brett, you've been around for a while. Put Brett on there. Just, you don't got to, yeah. Um, uh, Randy Music says, I would like to win in Humanoids by Barto Nunley. Who's Barto? <laughs> Barto. Who's Barto? <laughs> That's like one of our colleagues that says, Nutley. Bar uh, Nutley. And Barton's like, my name is Nunley. Like, it's in none of your business. Let's see here. Okay. <laughs> wow, you have tiger's blood? That's crazy. You must have heard the Garitano interview where he talks about tiger people being mm. made in the in the wilderness. In Humanoids with Barton. Barton, he says, I would like to win a David Weatherly book. Barton, hit me up. And I'll send you one, bro. <laughs> I can I can send you one tomorrow. I got them all. Um, and, and their autograph, too. These And I had to stalk you at the conference. I'm, thank God I did. Cause I was these like, are autographs. I was like, because like, Ken, Ken messaged me. Ken goes, hey, Bar uh, 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 he says, uh, what are you doing? I'm at the conference, and uh, David's here. Because I had told him, I said, because about the books, or whatever. Right. I said, dude, I'm going through, and I found some books that were autographed. Well, I found one of Ken's was an autograph. I don't know what that was or what happened. So I told Ken, I said, I don't know what's going on here. And so he goes, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be at this conference uh, this coming weekend. I said, okay. And then he said, are you going to try to make it out there? And I said, probably not. You know, I mean, I've been mean, tell Lyle and Ryan and everybody, you know, give you my best, whatever. But then he said, you were there. And I had this box of books. I said, oh, man, we got to go to San Antonio <laughs> because I need these books. Because I was giving away your books that weren't autographed. Right. So there's all these people that were like, Is, was it supposed to be autographed? And not to, you know, and everybody's very gracious. They're like, yeah. Um, but you, you had said that they were supposed to be autographed and I was like, yeah. And I apologize for that. But, you know, I'd sent them out yeah. without them being autographed because I had got those at the end of the conference. You remember that? The, the books? I Actually, got? that was an older box. I think that you had gotten really that was somewhere. Cause all the ones at the previous conference I signed for you. Geez. You know, so so sure. how did I end up with that box? I don't know. That's crazy. And so I was like, so I told everybody, I said, if you've gotten a book from about, uh, from Dave, uh, David Weatherly's uh, collection, whatever, and it's not autographed, I owe you an autographed book. But we got them all signed. And I'm glad yeah, that we did that. because we had a great dinner and we had a good time. And uh, and I'm glad now that you're going to be here in Texas. You know, I was very sad that you had decided to go to the Peach State. Um, but I was like, dude, uh, you know. Oh, I sucks. was just traveling some. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I was like, Migrating man, I was, for the summer. Yeah, yeah. You, you were visiting or whatever, but you were gone for a while, and I was like, dude, I just wanted you to be. Yeah, I've slow, I've slowed down with the travel, you know, mm -hmm. just uh, kind of, you know, just uh, readjusting things, you mm -hmm. know, since I since I turned uh, sixty. Yeah, so, at my house, which yeah. was actually pretty cool. So you know, just kind of slowing down a little bit on the travel and staying home in in Texas more, and you know. well, this is where it's at. Oh keep yeah! Keep telling everybody they need to get their butts over here. Yeah. So go ahead and hit the wheel, and let's see who's going to win uh, David Wedley book. <laughs> Tyler. Now, Tyler, in order to get this to you, okay, I need your your at your uh, address and all your information. Send it to me, Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com. That's how I can get it to you. And pick someone else. Let's do another one. <laughs> Brett. So, Brett, you finally won. Brett, you've been on. He's been on the wheel before, I think. And we'll do one more.
Who was that? Killing reality. Killing reality. Congratulations. We got War Criminal and Killing Reality. Jeez, dude, this sounds like a, a video game chat room here. <laughs> we might be a cult. It's like Army of Two or whatever. Uh, it's a like Gears of War. Uh, so, okay, folks. So, you guys, congratulations to tonight's winners. Uh, reality Killer, s- send me your information. Um, now, we're supposed to say unalived so we don't offend people. So, unaliving reality. Okay, that's what we're going to call you. And Barton, if you are serious, if you want a book, uh, call me tomorrow and I'll I'll get that I'll get that in the mail to you, brother. Uh so everybody who uh, ch- uh chipped in on the chat, we appreciate it on the on the uh donations. Thank you for that. We will be back on Sunday and don't forget uh to have your questions ready. We don't have a guest on Sunday. And we can get to your questions and we can answer them. Now, next week, I may have another guest who's going to be flying in. I'm not 100% sure yet, but uh, he is a uh, person, a very interesting guy. That's all I'm going to say. He does a lot of really, really cool work. Um, I get, What would you classify him? I don't want to – he doesn't like being classified. as. I would say a demonologist, but I wouldn't classify him. He doesn't like being classified. He does a lot of cool stuff with cool things, coolly. <laughs> <laughs> and he does it very cool. So he, he should be coming in probably that. And then the week after, we're going to have another good guest on. Um, one of our fellow colleagues will be in studio. And then another one the week after. And then somewhere in between all, all that, we're going to have the author, Max Hawthorne, is going to come on. Uh, so just stay tuned. we got a lot of stuff going on for the guest Sunday. I, I know Sunday went five hours mm-hmm. last Sunday because we just got into all kinds of stuff. And, and we just got into a groove. Yeah, and it just started happening, and, it, and, it, and it's, you know, um, everybody's been enjoying the Chris Garitano show that we did on Thursday. We dropped, and then the story, if you haven't heard the story from the priest, and uh, the preacher, he's not a priest, the priest was his friend. Now, let me clarify that. Uh, go and check that one out. That one was dropped on Tuesday. What this was was a, a man from El Salvador who ended up going to Nicaragua, and there he met a priest and that priest actually helped him with his building of the church. Now go and, and check that out. And there is a dogman encounter in that show, but people were confused. They thought that the guy who was the preacher was the one that had the dogman encounter. Somebody said he had that, and I was like, no, no, he had the. It was the priest, right? Yeah, the priest had the the, the dogman encounter, which led him to go and become a priest. That was kind of what inspired that. And this guy is a really good storyteller. I mean, he needs to write a book, but. He's a very humble guy, just like me, you know, very humble. Um, but uh, he, he gave it to me to tell. So everybody go and check that out, and I appreciate everybody's patronage. Thank you so much, Patreon. Oh, by the way, if you're on the Patreon, I, I mailed out yesterday. So you should all be getting your swag bags. I think there was like 11 different people or, or something. I think it was 11, wasn't it? It was quite a few. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, you're all going to be getting your stuff. That should be happening. So if you, if you sign up. $20, $30 tier, like I said, automatically I send you something. And uh, we're going to have a whole new bunch of stuff uh, unveiled that's going to be going to the conference. Sunday, I'm going to unveil the new PRT jersey. So in the day after tomorrow. And then I can't forget my dear friend Tom Cardos. He's trying to grow his channel. He's still uh, in the growing stages. Barton and I will be there on Monday. We're going to be interviewed by him to celebrate his uh, his show growing. And so everybody, tune in to Tom Cardos' show. I will give you the details in the Paranormal Roundtable group, and you can go and check us out on Monday. So I'll be on air Monday. I'll be on Sunday, Monday with Tom and, and Barton. Tuesday we'll drop the, the next episode, which is going to be a really good one, I think. Uh, then Thursday we'll do the Garitano, and then we're back at it again Friday. So, so it just keeps going. We're giving you more. You ask for more. This is what we're doing. Are you not entertained? Is this what you? Is this what you want? Is this what you crave? Huh? <laughs> I'm playing, folks. I'm messing around. All right. Seriously, I'm glad that you're here. Okay. Thank you for paying attention to me and listening to me run my mouth. Now, everybody, just remember, okay, the conference. We're all going to meet up, we're going to hang out, and we're going to go and, and we're going to take over a local Chuck E. Cheese, and we're all just going to go a crazy. Water park I'm joking. And... We're going to, we'll, we'll have catered food, don't worry. All right. 
Anyways, thank you for listening. Thank you. Appreciate guys. my guest being here, Dave Weatherly. Thanks, guys. Good night. Yep. And and Tony um, and Anthony over here behind the controls. Thank you so much, folks. I'll see you in a couple days. Good night. <laughs>